Um, let's get a recap for folks who maybe just be dipping into the story. Let's take it over to uh, Darren Kagan. Darren? Yeah, Miles, we're going to handle this in two ways. Of course, so this is a developing story. We're going to keep moving it forward, but we do realize that there are people who are tuning in as we go, and so we do want to recap so that you know the exact amount of information we know up to this point involving the space shuttle Columbia. We begin with NASA's oldest shuttle. It broke up this morning as it descended over central Texas. The shuttle was on its way toward a planned landing at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We have video to show you. It's from our affiliate WFAA in Dallas. It will show you multiple vapor trails as the shuttle was breaking up. Now, as you're watching this, the altitude was just over 200,000 feet. Seven astronauts on board. They included six Americans and the first Israeli ever in space, payload specialist Ilan Ramon. Debris fell over a very wide area from near the Dallas area to the Texas-Louisiana border. People as far east as Shreveport, Louisiana reported seeing and feeling an explosion as the shuttle broke apart. NASA is setting up an independent board trying to determine exactly what happened. This is indeed a tragic day for the NASA family, for the families of the astronauts who flew on STS-107, and likewise tragic for the nation. That's from a news conference you uh, saw live if you were with us in the last hour here on CNN. The first one that NASA has put out, they are saying another one about 3 p.m. Eastern where they will take questions. Of course, you're going to see that live right here on CNN. As we mentioned, Columbia, the oldest in the shuttle fleet, first launched back in 1981. It was on its 28th mission. We are covering this story all across the world from Israel here to the States and across the States. And Judy Woodruff is in Washington, D.C. with more. Judy. Thanks, Darren. Uh, we are keeping uh, an eye on the story here very much here in Washington. With me uh, in the studio is uh, uh, CNN's Patty Davis, who covers aviation for us. And Patty, you've got a little more information about what the Federal Aviation Administration is doing to collect and preserve the debris uh, that is scattered over several states. Well, what the Federal Aviation Administration has done is it's uh, put in effect a temporary flight restriction over Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, what it has done is a, anything within a 60-mile radius of Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, and below 3,000 feet, no planes allowed in that area. FAA trying to keep planes out of the way of, of anybody who may be involved in a recovery effort there for debris, trying to protect that uh, debris and, and let those, uh, res those, those teams do their work and not have anybody get in the way. Also, uh, we're told that Homeland Security Chief Tom Ridge has designated the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, as the lead agency to coordinate response and recovery of debris. Now, Ridge has called officials uh, in Arizona and New Mexico, uh, warning them about possible debris and uh, uh, trying to make sure that they preserve that debris uh, so that this investigation uh, can take place and they can piece together just what happened here. Patty, it's our understanding that uh, Tom Ridge has been contacting uh, uh, the governors. Uh, you mentioned Arizona, New Mexico. He's obviously also been in contact in Texas, where it's assumed the flight broke up. Uh, Oklahoma, as well as Louisiana, where you mentioned the, uh, uh, there's an effort now to, to restrict the airspace. We've also seen news reports of people in Arkansas who saw an explosion and presumably may see debris. So we, we are talking potentially uh, four or five states involved We're talking here. Yeah, a huge debris field. This uh, shuttle appears to have broken up at about 200,000 feet in the air. Now, if you consider uh, how, how far up a, a, a normal commercial aircraft normally flies, 35 to 40,000 feet, uh, would have a wide debris field. Imagine how wide at 200,000 feet in the air uh, these pieces would be flying. So it definitely will, it will be a multi-state effort. No question about it. Patty Davis, who covers aviation for us, and Patty mentioned Tom Ridge, the new director, uh, new secretary of the new department, first secretary of the new department of Homeland Security. Of course, so much of his attention has been focused on keeping the country safe in the aftermath of 9-11. Now, of course, he's dealing with a very different uh, kind of tragedy, but one that will require all of his attention as well. You can imagine uh, this happening on a Saturday morning here in Washington. This is a city tourists always flock to, one of the most if not the most popular museum in Washington, is the Air and Space Museum, part of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, there with us uh, on the scene is our own Bob Frank. And Bob, and I assume you've been talking to tourists and others who uh, 
uh, have to be as deeply affected by this as we are. If not more, uh, these were people who uh, were coming to the Air and Space Museum. This is one of the most popular exhibits, of course. It is the Columbia Shuttle exhibit. You can see in back of me the NASA feed. You can see the replica of the shuttle in back of me, and you can see pockets of people. As the briefing was going on, there was this somber, very sad look, and of course we still have other people here who have been um, uh, coming here to visit almost like they're coming to a shrine. And among them have been people from Israel. Your name, sir? Ziv. Z-I-V. Ziv. And, and, tell me, and tell me how you must feel. That's a great loss. It's a tragedy. Um, as an Israeli, I mourn and grieve with the families and the friends of the crew that was lost, of course, with the Israeli and American people. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad day, but I hope in the future it'll have a more successful ending than this one. Your country was celebrating because of the inclusion of this aspect. That is true. Everybody was very excited back at home, and this was a very bad ending for a, what could have been a great day. And among those who are here are many young people. One of the ambitions always has been to be an astronaut. How do you feel? I think that it's a terrible loss, and I just pray for the astronauts' families that that, it's, that they should just, it's just a loss. And I just pray that they just be happy for him. <laughs> just be happy. And here's your, here's your mom. How did you tell him this morning? Well, actually, we heard about it. Um, we were at Arlington Cemetery here, and we watched it on the news, and then we were headed over here anyway. So, um, like you said, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, um, so many few people take for granted. We just all of a sudden think, oh, another shuttle's gone up in the air. or something that we just take for granted anymore, and it's not, it's not something to take for granted at all. Had your son ever expressed the desire to be an astronaut? It's almost every child's dream. Well, they all say that at some time, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, we had a great loss today. But uh, we need to learn from this and move forward. Thank you very much. What you're hearing, of course, is a very typical of the reaction you will get here. A reaction that you will get around the country, reaction around the world. Uh, here in Washington, of course, Judy, people have a place to come to, to express that reaction. What amounts to, as I said, a bit of a shrine to the tragedy that occurred earlier this morning. Judy? All right, Bob Franken at the Air and Space Museum here in Washington. And, Bob, we have just learned that President Bush will address the nation uh, from the White House, from the Cabinet Room, uh, in just a few minutes. It's about three minutes before 2 Eastern time. We're told the President will speak to the nation at 2 o'clock. Let's bring in our White House correspondent, Suzanne Malveau, who's been at her post all morning. Suzanne, I know they've been uh, planning, making plans, but just now they've made the big announcement. Well, absolutely. We saw a couple of hours ago President Bush, who arrived back here at the White House, returning from Camp David, cutting that trip short. Uh, we saw him enter the residence and then on to the Oval Office with his chief of staff, Andy Card. We were told that he was notified of this tragedy. Uh, shortly after it happened, and at 10.30, he spoke with the director of NASA about the details of all of this. He uh, came back to the White House to better monitor the situation. Uh, Judy, as you know, the White House, um, the, the flag here lowered at half staff just a few hours ago, a very uh, symbolic of the, the tragedy here, recognizing that tragedy. Uh, as you may recall, this is really a time for, for comfort, to comfort the nation as well as to inform, uh, to mourn the lost. Uh, when, uh, when it was uh, January 28th, uh, 1986, when uh, President Ronald Reagan had this uh, very sad duty, he went just hours after the Challenger had exploded, and he said, I want to read this line to you. This is the last line that he delivered in his speech to the nation saying, we will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Uh, clearly, this is a very important moment for the president, uh, a need to confront, to comfort the nation, and also to talk about the sense of bravery, um, the, the sense of dedication that these people had aboard the shuttle. We have also learned that the president has spoken with Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon. Uh, as you know, one of those aboard the shuttle was an Israeli citizen, uh, giving his condolences, passing that along to Israel as well. Judy? Suzanne, you're, you are absolutely right. This is one of the most important uh, uh, jobs, uh, functions that a president can perform. Uh, not only is the president the leader of the country, the one who is the uh, making uh, decisions uh, day in and day out, but the president must be the uh, consoler in chief at a time like this, a time of great loss, of great tragedy. And you do remind us of uh, the role that President Reagan played in 1986. The nation shocked 
because at that time it was the first space accident in uh, something like 20 years. America was, was uh, completely uh, rocked back on its heels by the, by the idea uh, that there would be astronauts lost in space. And I remember because I was covering, uh, covering the Challenger explosion then, I was working for the public broadcasting system for PBS, and uh, President Reagan's remarks played an enormous role in holding the country and bringing the country together. And uh, the line that you, uh, that you quoted, uh, slipping the surly bonds of earth, is one that I think all of us remember. I have every reason to believe that uh, President Bush uh, and the people around him remember that and are acutely aware of the important role that the president plays at a time like this. Again, it is just after 2 o'clock Eastern Time. We are expecting any moment to hear from President Bush. He will be addressing the nation from the cabinet room there in the White House. Suzanne, when this happened, the president was at Camp David uh, planning to spend the weekend there after a very difficult week dealing with uh, Iraq. Absolutely, Judy. This is really a pivotal weekend for the president. As you know, Secretary of State Colin Powell to go before the United Nations Security Council on Wednesday to present the case against Saddam Hussein, additional evidence. This administration, under a great deal of pressure from some U.S. allies who want to see more information, more evidence uh, to, that would justify the possibility of using military action against Saddam Hussein, already the president really having quite a full plate this weekend. I should also mention as well, Judy, just kind of a sign of the times, uh, one of the assumptions that so many people made when they first saw that this uh, shuttle was missing, that they had lost contact, was uh, terrorism. That was something that people were thinking about. In 1986, that was not necessarily the first thought on everyone's mind. Uh, clearly, this White House, as well as many people, aware of the possibilities of the danger, but senior administration officials telling us there is no indication that that was the cause of this tragedy today. Judy? All right, Suzanne, as we said, we are waiting for President Bush to speak to the nation from the White House, from the Cabinet Room. And uh, again, as we wait uh, for his remarks, uh, my colleague Miles O'Brien has been with us all morning. Miles, I, even at this moment, I have a sense that, uh, you know, there was an enormous reluctance in 1986 when the Challenger exploded uh, for people. Nobody even wanted to think about going back into space again at that point. But you do have the sense now that Americans have somehow, as horrible as this is, we have come, somehow come to, uh, to the realization that space flight is dangerous, we will lose people from time to time. No one is saying we won't go into space again. Well, let's remember who was aboard Challenger. Krista McAuliffe, civilian, teacher. That, that launch, that tragedy was witnessed by school children all across this country. It was devastating for so many people, and particularly for children. And there was a certain poignance to that, uh, which made it a little more difficult, I think, for people to, to uh, handle. Uh, the sense of a, of a civilian on board that shuttle not fully appreciating the risks. In this case, a crew completely made up of test pilot types, engineers, career astronauts who fully understand the risk. Perhaps that has something to do with it. Perhaps the fact that school children the world over were not necessarily witnessing what we just saw this morning, perhaps that changes things. Um, as we look at Mission Control Houston, this is a remarkable scene here. You're seeing the good people of NASA, whose job it is to watch a space shuttle while it is in orbit from those consoles. Every last little technical item on a shuttle has a readout on a screen down here so that they know precisely what is going on at any given moment. Someone asked me earlier, is there a black box on the shuttle? That room is the black box. There is a constant stream of data to that room, giving them a full sense of what's happening to every last piece, every last system of a space shuttle. Right now, that team, which has spent the better part of the morning collecting its data, gathering up its data in order to prepare for an investigation, is now ready for what we are ready for, which is the President of the United States, who has returned to the White House, will be addressing those good folks at NASA who work so hard to make space travel, uh, while risky, a reasonable thing to do, and the rest of the nation. Let's listen to the president. My fellow Americans, this day has brought terrible news and great sadness to our country. 
At 9 o'clock this morning, Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our space shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. On board was a crew of seven, Colonel Rick Husband, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Anderson, Commander Laurel Clark, Captain David Brown, Commander William McCool, Dr. Kulpna Shavla, and Ilan Ramon, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. These men and women assumed great risk in the service to all humanity. In an age when space flight has come to seem almost routine, it is easy to overlook the dangers of travel by rocket and the difficulties of navigating the fierce outer atmosphere of the Earth. These astronauts knew the dangers, and they faced them willingly, knowing they had a high and noble purpose in life. Because of their courage and daring and idealism, we will miss them all the more. All Americans today are thinking as well of the families of these men and women who have been given this sudden shock and grief. You're not alone. Our entire nation grieves with you. And those you loved will always have the respect and gratitude of this country. The cause in which they died will continue. Mankind is led into the darkness beyond our world by the inspiration of discovery and the longing to understand. Our journey into space will go on. In the skies today, we saw destruction and tragedy. Yet farther than we can see, there is comfort and hope. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The same creator who names the stars also knows the names of the seven souls we mourn today. The crew of the shuttle Columbia did not return safely to Earth, yet we can pray that all are safely home. May God bless the grieving families, and may God, may God continue to bless America. President Bush, uh, after returning from Camp David uh, to the White House, up oh, he's coming back. Let's listen in. All right, we've obviously lost the signal uh, from the president, and um, we'll try to figure out what that's all about in just a bit. But um, we know they uh, didn't return safety, safely to Earth, he said, but we know they are home. Uh, president Bush uh, touching a chord today of sympathy for uh, the family members who lost their loved ones. Um, in mission control, they, they stood at rapt attention for the president as he address the nation and address them. They too feeling the loss there as we look at the scene there at Mission Control. Judy Woodruff, um, it's a difficult thing for a president to address a nation at this moment, isn't it? It certainly is. And Miles, you know, right now coming uh, in the midst of the crisis uh, the United States uh, faces, the decision the president faces uh, with regard to whether to go to, to war with Iraq. Um, this was the last thing, I think, on the minds of, uh, in all fairness, of the people uh, who work with the president uh, closely day in and day out. It was, of course, it was the last thing on all of our minds. Everyone has come to assume once again over the last 17 years that space flight uh, is, is as safe as it possibly can be. Uh, we are reminded again today that it is um, uh, subject to error uh, of what kind we don't know. Uh, but uh, it is, this is a day when the presidents, I, I think it's fair to say, earn their pay because he had to make that, those calls to the families of the seven astronauts, uh, which has to be the hardest thing that any president 
ever has to do. You know, if you read, if you read anything of history, you know uh, uh, the presidents who speak to the to the widows of those lost in combat. Um, uh, it's uh, it it is a job that none of us uh, would would covet. Indeed, indeed, finding the right words and and hearkening back to those uh, words of of Ronald Reagan. Um, which are, are as poignant today as they were in 1986. Uh, we will never forget them, nor uh, the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for the journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Uh, uh, George W. Bush um, using the same sorts of parallels and symbolism and analogy and reference to faith at this terrible moment of tragedy and mourning here in the United States as the, uh, it becomes evident that the Space Shuttle Columbia and her crew of seven is now lost. Let's um, listen in one more time to that moment in Mission Control, that last transmission. Everything seemed to be going routine. You'll hear the voice of James Hartsfield, public affairs officer for NASA in Houston, as well as some um, air to ground communication. At the other end in the shuttle is uh, Rick Husband, the commander of the Space Shuttle. Let's, oh, let's and let's um, listen in on that. toward Florida, now approaching the New Mexico-Texas border. Altitude, 40 miles. Speed, 13,200 miles per hour. Range to touchdown, 1,400 miles. The shuttle in the left bank with wings angled about uh, 57 degrees to horizontal. In Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages and we did not copy your last. Roger. Uh, staff at the White House. A nation begins a period of mourning for the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Seven brave astronauts uh, pushing the envelope, uh, exploring the high frontier, and then inexplicably it all ends in an instant, 200,000 feet above the state of Texas. Before they left, I spoke with the first Israeli astronaut ever to travel to space, Ilan Ramon. Ilan Ramon. That was obviously while he was in flight. I apologize for that. That was the Saturday after launch. He was telling me what it was like to try to look down on his home country of Israel. Said he had a little difficulty finding it. Ultimately, he did get a good chance to see it and conducted a series of experiments, among other things, to test the links between uh, dust particles in the air and global warming. Rick Husband was on his second flight, his first as a commander, and uh, he talked a little bit about flying with Ilan Ramon. Personally, the thing that I have really enjoyed the most about Elon and, and his uh, family is just their warmness and uh, the, the openness that they have in, in sharing their home. And, and from my standpoint, also just learning more about Israel, learning more about, uh, I'd say, the, the Jewish culture. And with myself, I, being a Christian, I take a, a specific interest in in kind of the the, the biblical or uh, spiritual aspect as well, which has been a very interesting thing for me. Rick, Rick Husband, as he referred to there, a devout Christian, 
uh, learning a little bit about Judaism through the eyes of Alain Ramon. Alain Ramon and his crewmate on this mission, which was off delayed, a um, series of problems with uh, the shuttle and scheduling issues. Other missions took priority to the International Space Station. Uh, this mission finally taking off some 16 days ago and going up until that point at 9 a.m. Eastern time this morning, uh, up until that point, nearly flawlessly for the seven-person crew as they conducted a series of experiments, some 80 experiments in all, over the course of this 16-day mission. Uh, NASA has, uh, is in the early stages of its investigation already. As you look at this tape from WFAA, shot from Dallas, you can see what happens. What seems like a single streaky meteor quickly becomes three, four, five meteors as the Space Shuttle Columbia breaks up in midair, traveling 18 times the speed of sound uh, at an altitude uh, of some 40 miles above us. And um, that picture tells you what happened, but offers up many, many questions uh, to us at this hour as to what could have happened, what might have caused it. Uh, all, a whole series of things will be uh, discussed and looked at. And uh, as one of the uh, people we talked to earlier mentioned, uh, an engineer who was involved in the uh, Challenger investigation, no one in the early stages of Challenger could have anticipated that it came down to a rubber O-ring that was too brittle and thus allowed hot gases to spill from those solid rocket boosters on the side of the space shuttle, spill into the external tank and cause an explosion in there. That, that's ultimately what happened. At the initial stages after Challenger, they were looking at the main engines and something there. So it took some time for them to come up with that uh, whole scenario. Eventually it was found, eventually it was fixed, and eventually they flew. It took the better part, two, two years, almost really three years, before uh, the return to flight of the space shuttle Discovery. Um, and that uh, is probably the kind of time frame that we're going to be talking about here as the uh, NASA and the country uh, endeavors to find out precisely what happened to the Space Shuttle Columbia before any other shuttle leaves the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. Let's get it. War heute, liebe Zuschauer, das dritte Mal in der Geschichte der US-Raumfahrt, dass bei Missionen Menschen ums Leben kamen. Bei dem Brand in einer Apollo-Kapsel starben 1967 drei Astronauten. Beim Challenger-Unglück 1986, vor ziemlich genau 17 Jahren, waren es sieben Menschen. Und die heutige Katastrophe erinnert doch sehr an diesen Absturz. Claudia Engfeld mit einem Rückblick. Es geschah nur 75 Sekunden nach dem Start. Die Challenger explodiert vor den Augen der schockierten Weltöffentlichkeit. Fünf Männer und zwei Frauen sterben in der Raumfähre. Eine der Frauen, Christa McAuliffe, eine Lehrerin. Sie wollte später Schülern in aller Welt von ihren Erlebnissen berichten. Monatelang hatte sie für ihren Aufenthalt im All trainiert. Für sie war es die Erfüllung ihres sehnlichsten Wunsches, ein Wunsch, den sie mit dem Leben bezahlte. Fassungslosigkeit und Entsetzen, ein solches Unglück schien undenkbar. Es ist ein schwarzer Tag für Amerika. Wir weinen um sieben Männer und Frauen. Wir trauern um sieben Helden. Der Start, er war an jenem schwarzen Tag immer wieder verschoben worden. Kurz nachdem die Challenger dann doch abgehoben hatte, trat bereits Rauch aus. Und Sekunden später hatten die Flammen die vordere Hälfte der Raumfähre eingehüllt. Später stellt sich heraus, es war ein technischer Defekt. Die Tragödie verursacht durch schadhafte Dichtungsringe an den Antriebswerken. Ich habe mir noch jahrelang Vorwürfe gemacht, dass ich nicht genug nachgefragt habe, dass ich vielleicht nicht gründlich genug gewesen bin. Ich habe mich persönlich schuldig gefühlt. Die Katastrophe, sie hatte weitreichende Folgen für die gesamte amerikanische Raumfahrt. Die Space Shuttle-Flüge wurden für längere Zeit unterbrochen. Es wurden neue, noch strengere Sicherheitsstandards eingeführt. Doch jetzt, fast genau 17 Jahre nach der Challenger-Katastrophe, steht fest, die absolute Sicherheit gibt es nicht, nicht in der bemannten Raumfahrt. Die zentrale Frage jetzt natürlich, warum ist die Columbia abgestürzt? Es wird nach Ursachen geforscht. Eine Expertenkommission in den USA wird gebildet, um herauszufinden, was denn die Ursache für den Absturz der Columbia war. Der Raumfahrtexperte Hermann Köller aus Berlin vermutet, dass sich Kacheln des Hitzeschildes lösten. Die Besatzung hatte aber keine Chance, die Katastrophe abzuwenden. Sie werden gemerkt haben, irgendwas stimmt nicht. Und das Ganze passiert dann in zwei, drei Minuten. 
bis die Teile sich lösen. Und das merkt man natürlich an dem unruhigen Flug sozusagen, wenn sich Teile lösen. Das gibt große Rucks und da merken sie jetzt, es passiert. Also in drei Minuten oder so ist passiert gewesen, so dass sie dann äh, die Kabine explodiert ist, weil die ja unter Innendruck ist. Und wenn die Löcher hat, dann fliegt alles äh, durch die Gegend und dann ist, wenn der Luftdruck weg in dem Moment, äh, sind sie tot. Was äh, mit fast hundertprozentiger Sicherheit ausgeschlossen werden kann, liebe Zuschauer, ist ein terroristischer Anschlag. Es gab zwar entsprechende Spekulationen, allein aufgrund der Tatsache, dass ein israelischer Astronaut mit an Bord war. Aber es ist ganz einfach so, dass es keine Rakete gibt, die die Raumfähre Columbia in der Höhe von 60.000 Metern hätte erreichen können. Es ist auf jeden Fall klar, es müssen technische Hintergründe sein, die zu diesem Unglück geführt haben. Peter Hantjes berichtet über die Sicherheitsaspekte der Columbia. Der Start des Space Shuttles ist der kritischste Moment des gesamten Fluges. Nur mit Hilfe zweier Feststoffraketen und einem gewaltigen Zusatztank hebt das 2000 Tonnen Gefährt vom Boden ab. Jeder noch so kleine Sicherheitsmangel kann da zur Katastrophe führen. Bei der furchtbaren Explosion der Challenger 1986 war es eine defekte Dichtung am Tank. Sieben Astronauten mussten dafür mit dem Leben bezahlen. Seitdem brechen die NASA-Techniker Starts schon bei kleinsten Sicherheitszweifeln ab. Wie hier 1995, als ein Specht Löcher in die Schutzschicht des Zusatztanks gehackt hatte. Wenn Antrieb oder Außenhaut der Raumfähre beschädigt sind, kann das furchtbare Folgen haben, wie wir wissen. Deswegen gehen wir in solchen Situationen lieber kein Risiko ein. Das Problem? Technisch sind die Raumfähren auf dem Stand von vor 20 Jahren. Das erste Shuttle startete am 12. April 1981. Seitdem transportierten die Lastesel der NASA fast 2 Millionen Kilo Ladung und mehr als 600 Astronauten in die Umlaufbahn der Erde, darunter auch sieben Deutsche. Als vielversprechender Nachfolger wurde die Venture Star gehandelt. Rund fünf Jahre Arbeit und umgerechnet knapp drei Milliarden Mark hatten die Amerikaner in die Entwicklung des Prototyps gesteckt. Ein diesmal einstufiger Raumtransporter, bei dem der Bauch den Treibstoff aufnimmt, der flache dreieckige Körper Flügel weitgehend überflüssig macht und der komplett wiederverwendbar sein sollte. Doch wegen technischer Probleme mit den gewaltigen Triebwerken und explodierender Kosten wurde das ehrgeizige Projekt im vergangenen Jahr von US-Präsident Bush eingestellt. Inzwischen hat man aus den Fehlern gelernt und ist zu mehrstufigen Lösungen zurückgekehrt. Insgesamt 15 verschiedene Konzepte wetteifern derzeit um die Shuttle-Nachfolge. In der Vergangenheit haben wir uns zu sehr auf ein Modell versteift. Wir mussten erst einmal unsere Köpfe davon freimachen, aber diesmal, denke ich, liegen wir richtig. Wir haben die unterschiedlichsten Konzepte sowohl für die Bauweise als auch für die Technik und lassen den Markt genau analysieren. So werden wir das Optimum erreichen. Die Raumfähren der zweiten Generation sollen sicherer, zuverlässiger und vor allem preiswerter werden. Das Ziel, die Transportkosten von heute 20.000 auf 2.000 Dollar pro Kilo Nutzlast zu senken. Dabei hilft das Mehrstufenkonzept, denn wie bei diesem Entwurf von Lockheed Martin sind alle Stufen wiederverwendbar. Sie können eigenständig zur Erde zurückkehren und landen. Der Einsatz soll sowohl für kommerzielle Zwecke als auch für NASA-Missionen möglich sein. Außerdem lassen sich die neuen Raumtransporter durch die mehrstufige Bauweise häufiger einsetzen als die alten. So senken wir die Kosten. Auch bei der Entwicklung scheint bereits gespart worden zu sein. Dieser Vorschlag von Northrop Grumman mit dem eigentlichen Shuttle auf der Spitze erinnert stark an das bereits in den 80er Jahren eingestellte europäische Hermes-Konzept. Nur, dass bei der amerikanischen Lösung die Raumfähre von einem Trägersystem angeschoben wird, das wiederverwendbar sein soll. Bei der ESA-Raumfähre Hermes war für den Schub ins All eine Ariane-Rakete vorgesehen, deren ausgebrannte Stufen bei einer Rückkehr in die Atmosphäre verglühen. 
Früher verschwanden Entwürfe, die abgelehnt wurden, wieder viel zu schnell in der Versenkung. Diesmal werden wir die Erkenntnisse jeder einzelnen Entwicklung unter allen Mitbewerbern teilen. Nur so kann am Ende das Beste dabei herauskommen. Die Zeit drängt. Bis 2006 will sich die NASA für ein Modell entschieden haben. Spätestens in zehn Jahren sollen dann die Transporter der zweiten Generation die heutigen Space Shuttles abgelöst haben. Bis dahin müssen die Raumfähren Oldtimer noch durchhalten. Liebe Zuschauer, wir machen eine ganz kurze Pause, aber bleiben Sie bei uns. Wir sind in wenigen Minuten wieder für Sie da. Natürlich wieder mit Hintergründen und allen Informationen zum Absturz der Columbia. Bis gleich. Das Shuttle ist verloren. Als ein NASA-Sprecher diesen Satz sagte, da wussten die Amerikaner, dass zum zweiten Mal die Mission eines Space Shuttles tödlich endete. Sieben Astronauten, darunter ein Israeli, starben, als heute Nachmittag die Columbia über Texas zerbrach. Blauer Himmel, Sonnenschein, eigentlich optimale Bedingungen für einen Landeanflug in Florida. Doch kurz nach 9 Uhr amerikanischer Zeit passiert das überraschende Unglück. Die Space Shuttle Columbia explodiert. Das ist ein tragischer Augenblick für die NASA, die Familien der Astronauten und die ganze Nation, sagte NASA-Chef Jean O'Keefe bei der ersten Pressekonferenz. Das Bodenkontrollzentrum in Houston im Bundesstaat Texas. Hier wird jeder Shuttleflug überwacht. Als der Funkkontakt zur Kolumbia abbricht, fliegt sie in einer Höhe von 60.000 Metern und mit einer Geschwindigkeit von rund 20.000 Kilometern pro Stunde. Das entspricht etwa sechsfacher Schallgeschwindigkeit. Die Astronauten, darunter fünf Männer und zwei Frauen, sind vermutlich bereits zehn Sekunden nach dem Unglück tot. Ihre Mission dauerte insgesamt 16 Tage. In dieser Zeit führten sie mehr als 80 wissenschaftliche Experimente durch. We can't let their sacrifice... Ihr Opfer soll nicht umsonst gewesen sein. Der Tag heute macht uns wieder einmal deutlich, dass das Überwinden von Grenzen immer noch mit großen Risiken verbunden ist, selbst nach 113 Flügen. Wir glauben immer, Missionen im All seien Routine. Aber dieser Tag heute beweist, sie sind es nicht. Normalerweise hinterlässt die Raumfähre nur einen Kondensstreifen. Hier sieht man mehrere. Ein Zeichen dafür, dass die Fähre 20 Minuten vor ihrer Landung auseinandergebrochen ist. Rund um die texanische Stadt Dallas fielen in der Nähe einer Autobahn Trümmerstücke auf die Erde. Augenzeugen berichten, es habe einen lauten Knall gegeben, als die Columbia am Himmel explodierte. 16. Januar, der Start der US-Raumfähre Columbia vom Weltraumbahnhof Cape Canaveral in Florida. Aus der Ferne betrachtet scheint alles glatt zu gehen, aber wie sich herausstellt, hat die Columbia in diesem brenzligen Moment einen Teil der Isolierung eines Außentanks verloren. Vermutlich ist er gegen die linke Tragfläche geschlagen und hat sie leicht beschädigt. Die NASA hatte diesen Schaden als gering eingestuft. Jetzt muss untersucht werden, ob er eventuell ein Grund für den Absturz heute ist. Der Landeplatz in Cape Canaveral, hier hatten sich schon frühzeitig Angehörige der Astronauten versammelt. Nachdem sie von dem Absturz erfuhren, wurden sie in ein abgeriegeltes Gebäude auf dem Gelände gebracht. Der amerikanische Präsident hat sein Beileid ausgedrückt. Die Flaggen in den Vereinigten Staaten wurden auf Halbmast gehisst. Die Katastrophe geschah hoch über Texas. Augenzeugen sprechen von einem ohrenbetäubenden Lärm. Eine Frau in Huntington, das liegt südöstlich von Dallas, sagte, es war, als würde ein Zug über unser Grundstück fahren, als wäre es direkt vom Haus. Ein Junge sagte, dass die Luft nach Gummi roch. Die Amerikaner sind eine Technik- und Raumfahrt begeisterte Nation. Und deswegen sind sie auch immer mit einem halben Ohr dabei, wenn eine Raumfähre startet oder landet, auch wenn das längst Routine geworden ist. Und so hat sich die Nachricht von der Katastrophe heute in Windeseile rumgesprochen. Reaktionen aus New York. Am Times Square in New York laufen die neuesten Meldungen über die Explosion der Raumfähre Columbia vom Band. Die meisten New Yorker hatten von dem Unglück kurz nach 9 Uhr auch Zeit aus dem Fernsehen erfahren. Am sonst so hektischen Times Square halten sich an diesem trüben Vormittag hier mitten in Manhattan nur wenige Passanten auf. Die erste Reaktion, die Menschen sind geschockt. Ich habe es gerade in den letzten zehn Minuten erfahren auf dem Bildschirm hier. Es ist einfach schrecklich. Ich habe gebetet, ich bin natürlich sehr traurig. Als ich aus Dallas, Texas kommend in New York gelandet bin, hat mich meine Frau angerufen. 
Sie erzählte mir ganz aufgeregt, dass sie über unserem Haus einen unglaublich lauten Knall gehört hat. Ich glaube nicht, dass es ein Anschlag gewesen ist. Die Raumfähre war viel zu hoch in der Atmosphäre. Es ist schon wieder eine Tragödie. Nach 1986, als die Challenger kurz nach dem Start explodiert war, heute nun das mit der Columbia. Die Columbia war ja die älteste Raumfähre der Amerikaner. Sie hatte schon viele Missionen hinter sich. Ich frage mich, ob sie auf dem neuesten Stand war. Es passiert zu einer Zeit, in der die USA Unterstützung und Freude bräuchten, um das Land voranzubringen. Mein Mann war lange in der Raumfahrtindustrie beschäftigt und er hat auch beim Space Shuttle Projekt mitgearbeitet. Wir sollten an der Raumfahrt auf jeden Fall festhalten. Viele New Yorker wollen an diesem Tag wieder schnell nach Hause, um die neuesten Informationen in den Fernsehnachrichten mitzubekommen. Trauer auch in Israel. Die Menschen dort waren so stolz auf ihren ersten israelischen Astronauten an Bord einer Raumstation, an Bord einer Fähre. Inzwischen hat sich die Nachricht auch dort im Land rumgesprochen und man ist schockiert über das bittere Ende für den 48-jährigen Astronauten Ilan Ramon. Gestern noch hatte Ilan Ramon per Funk mit seiner Frau gesprochen hatte von der Faszination berichtet, die Erde aus dem Weltall zu sehen. Ganz Israel war stolz, dass einer ihrer Kampfpiloten nun im Shuttle saß. Ein israelisches Fernsehteam hatte den Astronauten mit seiner Frau Rona und seinen vier Kindern zu Hause besucht. Ilan, Ramons Vater, hatte Auschwitz überlebt. Aus dem Lager hatte Ilan die Zeichnung eines Kindes mit ins All genommen. Okay. Sein Bruder berichtete heute, wir haben immer wieder per E-Mail mit ihm im Weltall kommuniziert. Er hat uns auf dem gleichen Weg geantwortet und geschrieben, er fühle sich über den Wolken. Es ist schon überraschend, dass so lange nichts passiert ist, erst bei der Landung. Und es ist besonders traurig, dass es einen von uns getroffen hat. Ich bin traurig und schockiert. Mein Mitleid gilt vor allem der Familie. Aber auch dem Staat Israel, nachdem wir zunächst so etwas erreicht hatten und dann endete es so schrecklich. Ich kann gar nicht sagen, das ist ein Desaster, nicht nur für die Familien, sondern für die ganze Menschheit. Und immer wieder sah man heute im israelischen Fernsehen die stolze Szene, wie die Regierung in Jerusalem vor einigen Tagen gemeinsam den Start des ersten Israelis ins All verfolgte. Was hat die Columbia zerbrechen lassen? Die NASA hält sich mit Spekulationen natürlich zurück. Es sind ja gerade erst die ersten Trümmer gefunden worden, Tom Bure in Washington. Was kann man denn zur Minute über die Unglücksursache seriös sagen? Seriös muss man sehr vorsichtig sein, aber es gab sehr schnell eine erste Einschätzung der Behörden und der Experten, nämlich zur Beruhigung der Bevölkerung herausgegeben, kurz nachdem die Katastrophe bekannt wurde, dass ein Terroranschlag die unwahrscheinlichste Variante äh, ist äh, als Hypothese für eine Ursache. Man muss sich vorstellen, dass die, äh, dass die Columbia in einer Höhe von über 63 Kilometern flog, sehr schnell über 20.000 Stundenkilometer und das wäre sehr, sehr schwierig von außen mit einer Rakete zum Beispiel äh, einen solchen Flugkörper zu treffen. Also das ist dass, wenn man so will, beruhigende, dass ein Terroranschlag der unwahrscheinlichste Ur die unwahrscheinlichste Ursache ist. Wie hat Präsident Bush auf die Nachricht von dieser Katastrophe reagiert? Ja, Präsident Bush befand sich, als er davon erfuhr, mit Tony Blair auf seinem Landsitz in Camp David, etwa anderthalb Stunden von Washington entfernt. Er brach das Gespräch mit äh, Tony Blair angeblich sofort ab, äh, trommelte seine Berater zusammen, wurde informiert. Und dann reiste er in aller Eile ins Weiße Haus zurück. Er gab hier vor einer halben Stunde kurz nach 20 Uhr eine Pressekonferenz. Sie war sehr kurz, sie war sehr emotional. Es wurden dort zwar keine neuen Fakten vorgetragen, die nicht schon bekannt gewesen wären, aber äh, es, es vermittelt doch einen Eindruck von dem Schock, unter dem die Nation, die, unter dem die Nation steht, pardon, und den der Präsident versuchte in Worte zu kleiden. Er nannte zum Beispiel alle Namen der Gestorbenen. Hier deshalb die ersten Sätze der Pressekonferenz. Dieser Tag hat uns schreckliche Nachrichten und große Trauer gebracht. Um 9 Uhr verlor die Bodenstation den Kontakt zur Columbia. Kurz danach flogen Trümmer vom Himmel über Texas. Die Columbia ist verloren, pardon, und dann las Bush auch noch die Namen aller sieben Crewmitglieder vor. Die Raumfahrtkatastrophe trifft die Amerikaner mitten in Kriegsvorbereitungen. Wird das irgendeine Auswirkung haben? 
Nun, kein Politiker wird sich leisten können, irgendeine Verbindung zu ziehen zwischen dem Krieg und dieser Tragödie. Das auszunutzen für politische, tagespolitische Zwecke, würde sofort, glaube ich, vom Wähler und vom Land bestraft werden. Wenn überhaupt so, ist es eine Art von psychologischer Grundstimmung, eine Art geschockter und ernster Grundstimmung. Das heißt, welche Prüfungen werden uns noch auferlegt? Denn auch die Entscheidung, die ansteht über Krieg und Frieden, nimmt das Land nicht so leichtfertig, wie es manchmal scheint. Es hat immer wieder Pannen und auch Unglücke gegeben bei der NASA. Hat die Organisation noch das Vertrauen des amerikanischen Volkes? Ja, das kann man sagen, aber man darf nicht vergessen, dass schon in den 90er Jahren Kürzungen eingesetzt hatten. Denn die Tendenz der konservativen Mehrheiten im Kongress und auch konservativer Regierungen im Weißen Haus ist es, die Regierung klein zu halten, Steuern zu kürzen und auch staatliche Ausgaben zu kürzen. Insofern war die NASA schon großen Kürzungen unterworfen gewesen, aber der Stolz auf diese Organisation ist nach wie vor vorhanden. Dankeschön, Tom Buro. Nach Washington. Die, um, die Geschichte der amerikanischen Raumfahrt ist eine Geschichte der Erfolge, aber auch der Katastrophen. Ein Rückblick. Die Bilder von der Explosion der Challenger vor 17 Jahren sind bis heute tief im Bewusstsein der Amerikaner eingebrannt. Die Katastrophe tötete nicht nur die sieben Astronauten an Bord der Raumfähre, sondern erschütterte in Sekunden den Glauben an die grenzenlose Beherrschbarkeit moderner Technik. Trotziger Trost vom Präsidenten. Die Zukunft gehört nicht den Zaghaften, sie gehört den Mutigen. Die Challenger-Crew hat uns in die Zukunft bringen wollen. Wir werden den Weg weitergehen. Kaum etwas symbolisierte Amerikas Selbstbewusstsein in der Mitte des letzten Jahrhunderts eindrucksvoller als die bemannte Raumfahrt. Wir werden noch in diesem Jahrzehnt auf dem Mond wandern. Nicht, weil die Aufgabe gering ist, sondern gerade weil sie so groß ist. Milliarden wurden investiert, um die Visionen von Forschern und Politikern zu erfüllen. Von der Besiedlung anderer Planeten war ebenso die Rede wie von täglichen Starts von Raumfähren. Vieles ist bis heute Science Fiction geblieben. Und schon ein Jahr bevor der erste Mensch den Mond betrat, hatte es die ersten Toten gegeben. Bei einem Test vor dem Start von Apollo 7 explodierte im Januar 1961 die Raumkapsel. Die drei Astronauten verbrannten noch am Boden. Auch Apollo 13, der dritte Flug zum Mond, wäre beinahe in einer Katastrophe geendet. Doch die dramatische und erfolgreiche Rettungsaktion an Bord bot den Stoff für Heldensagen. Die Verfilmung durch Hollywood kam zwangsläufig. So bleibt das Ende von Columbia das dritte große Unglück in der Geschichte der amerikanischen Raumfahrt. Ernst Messerschmidt ist einer der deutschen Astronauten, die schon einmal mit einem Space Shuttle geflogen sind. 1985 war das mit der Challenger. Guten Abend, Herr Messerschmidt. Guten Abend, Herr Blasberg. Herr Messerschmidt, was glauben Sie, ist am Himmel über Texas passiert? Eine schlimme, eine schreckliche Katastrophe, die uns alle, die wir Raumfahrt betreiben, insbesondere uns von der Europäischen Weltraumorganisation ESA, sehr traurig macht. Und wir haben unseren amerikanischen Kollegen auch unsere Anteilnahme ausgedrückt. Leider äh, konnten wir auch nicht weitere Einzelheiten erfahren, die zu diesem Unfall geführt haben bis auf Flughöhe, Fluggeschwindigkeit, aber wir wissen nicht die näheren Umstände. Es gibt ja mehrere Theorien. Der Teil eines Tanks habe die Tragfläche beschädigt, das Hitzeschild beschädigt. Es kann aber auch ein falscher Anstellwinkel gewesen sein, gerade in dieser kritischen Phase. Was halten Sie für wahrscheinlicher? Ich kann nicht mal über Wahrscheinlichkeiten spekulieren. Die Fluglage des Space Shuttles ist in allen Flugphasen wichtig, insbesondere kurz vor der Landung. Was sicher zu sein scheint, ist die Flughöhe von 660.000 von 660 Fuß, das heißt etwa 20 Kilometer Höhe. Wir haben bei dieser Höhe eine Geschwindigkeit von Mach 6, das ist hypersonisch. Und äh, das ist äh, gerade am Ende der heißen Phase, die ist eigentlich schon überwunden. Und äh, die äh, Nase des äh, Space Shuttles wird abgesenkt äh, und man bereitet sich dann eigentlich auch schon auf die Landung vor. Die Columbia ist die älteste Fähre gewesen, 22 Jahre alt. Sagt es etwas über Ihre Sicherheit? Nein, äh, das äh, glaube ich nicht. Äh, man äh, nimmt diese Fahrzeuge alle fünf, sechs Jahre völlig auseinander. Man kennt äh, die Geschichte jedes einzelnen Bauteils. Dieses wird äh, inspiziert und nur eingebaut, wenn es äh, so gut ist wie ein neues. Äh, das heißt, diese Shuttles äh, sind zwar 
vom Zeitpunkt äh, ihrer Entstehung schon äh, 20 Jahre, 25 Jahre, je nachdem entfernt. Aber äh, alle lebensnotwendigen Sy Systeme werden ständig erneuert und überprüft. Die Columbia kam von der Internationalen Raumstation. Dort sind noch drei Astronauten. Können die jetzt überhaupt versorgt werden, wenn die Flüge, was wahrscheinlich ist, erst einmal gestoppt werden? Columbia hat eine der wenigen Missionen durchgeführt, eben nicht zur Raumstation, sondern das war eine Wissenschaftsmission zur Untersuchung eben von bestimmten Experimenten, Disziplinen, die mit der Schwerelosigkeit zu tun haben. An Bord war eine Einrichtung, ähnlich wie das Space Lab, das wir früher betrieben haben, aber etwas kleiner, das Space Lab, und man hat circa 80 Experimente durchgeführt. Das war also eine Mission völlig unabhängig von der Raumstation, eben auch um nach wie vor eben die diversen Zielsetzungen, denen sich die bemannte Raumfahrt auch zuwendet, Trotzdem nämlich Forschung mal, durchzuführen. Bitte um kurze Antwort, was passiert mit den Astronauten auf der Raumstation? Können sie versorgt werden? Die sind versorgt und wir haben noch ein zweites Transportsystem, die russische Soyuz-Rakete. Man kann sowohl damit eben die Astronauten austauschen, wie auch Nachschubgüter bringen mit einer unbemannten Version einer Kapsel namens Progress. Dankeschön, Ernst Messerschmidt, für diese ersten Einschätzungen. Danke nach Stuttgart. Weitere Hintergrundinformationen heute Abend hier in den Tagesthemen und morgen um 16.30 Uhr in der ARD. Hier wird Sie gleich Frank Elsner begrüßen. Danke für Ihr Interesse an diesem Brennpunkt und zum Schluss noch einmal die Bilder des Tages, die Bilder der Columbia-Katastrophe. We're talking on the telephone with Walter Cronkite, who uh, covered for the CBS News for so many years space travel. How are astronauts, how are these people who take this enormous risk, how are they different from you and me, from the rest of us? Well, a great number of them, the professional flyers, of course, uh, uh, have chosen that, uh, that uh, career of risk in the first place uh, by becoming not only ace pilots uh, in the military services, but test pilots as well. Uh, in which uh, they, they, uh, every flight is, uh, is, is loaded with danger uh, of the unknown. They're, they're, they're trying out equipment that has never been flown uh, in, in uh, the air before. Uh, they, they, that is their career. To them, it is only the, uh, another step to move into the, that, uh, the uniform of an astronaut. Uh, for the others, the doctors, we had a couple aboard this flight, uh, the, uh, uh, the specialists in one science or another who go uh, in the pursuit of their uh, science, uh, they, they are extraordinary individuals who have chosen to get out of the laboratory and the, and the hospitals and, and, uh, and, and learn the, the, the secrets of uh, survival in space and then they make these flights uh, I, I think we should uh, we should applaud all of them Walter Cronkite uh, talking uh, with us uh, on the telephone uh, Miles O'Brien please join us Walter uh, I'd like to uh, tap uh, your deep reservoir of knowledge and memory um, we remember Challenger so well and how long it took for um, NASA to get back in the skies it was almost three years uh, of course, the Apollo 1 fire, which happened um, 1967, January 27th, uh, interesting, coincidentally, like the day before, there, there was less of a period of time because uh, it was in the midst of the moon race. Those were very different days, weren't they? Uh, yeah, I didn't quite understand you. Is this... Uh, the, the period of time... Uh, is, this, is this Miles? Yes, it is. Yeah, right, Miles. I didn't quite understand. You're doing a great job this morning, by the way, Miles, as, as uh, CNN and rest of us of now expect well thank you but, but uh, i didn't quite understand your last question i was trying to remember how long it was from the apollo one fire to the return to the apollo missions it was much quicker it wasn't the full three years that we recall from the challenger well, that, days that, that was a long one of course that was the longest delay that was longer than the one i think that uh, that uh, succeeded the, uh, uh, the the challenger disaster uh, I 
can't remember the exact numbers now, but it seems to me it was two and a half years or more, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, well, I can't remember the numbers right on, on the top, off the top of my head, but I, what I'm trying to point out here is that there will be a fairly long period of time here for all of this to uh, play it out. As, as Bill Reedy of the manned space flight had said, we've got to you know, find it, fix it, and, and, and resume. Uh, there is tremendous resilience to the space program, um, which you can attest to from its earlier days. I'm curious, do you, do you, can you feel, do you feel confident that there will be a return to flight one day? for the United States? A return to what? A return to space for people oh, in, in the course. United States. Of course. A return to space? Well, I don't, I don't think this will seriously interrupt our program. Uh, uh, of course, it's going to depend entirely on how early they're able to determine the cause of, of this tragedy uh, and what it requires to, to fix it. Uh, that that's that's the timetable that we face now, but uh, but uh, we're we're committed to space. We're not going to desert uh, um, or the exploration of space uh, because of a setback as as tragic uh, as it is. Uh, we're committed and we're going to continue. Uh, the the only debate, as you know now, uh, in the space program, and I think this is the only debate that will continue, uh, is. Uh, is the proportion that we devote to robotic space, uh, the space uh, to the early experiments in landing on Mars uh, uh, with unmanned flight, and the uh, and the devotion of time and expenditures of manned flight in space. And that uh, debate will continue regardless of uh, the outcome of all of this. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. The, the, uh, this may this may bolster to a degree the argument of those who claim we we can do as much with robotic flight as we can with uh, manned vehicles, uh, but uh, the argument for manned vehicles is still very strong. That the curiosity of the individual who's landing and walking on those distant or orbs out there in space um, is um, uh, of a value that cannot be replaced by by machines who are simply communicating with men on Earth. Do you think, uh, Walter, that uh, the American people, up until something like this happens, take this for granted, what we see routinely there? Yes, I do. I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you know, Miles, as well as any of us, that, uh, that these, these shuttle flights don't even get in the newspapers, in the back pages, not even by the, by the funny by the comic pages, there, there's no mention of, of the flights at all, unless indeed there is a daring deed out there in, uh, uh, in, in repairing the, the, the Hubble telescope or something of that kind, or uh, helping to build uh, additions on the, the uh, Sky City out there, the, the international orbit. The, uh, uh, we, we don't pay any attention at all. It's just routine. It's as routine as the... Uh, as the commuter trains are running out of New York City. Hmm. It's and may, maybe more so. Yeah, yeah, maybe more so. Uh, let's take a look at that crew for just a moment. And I wonder, you know, um, they go into it with not a blasé attitude. I, I know all these people, and I talk to them all the time, and, and what they tell you to a person is this, this is a real dicey proposition. It is risky business. And, uh, but a calculated risk, that's the term they use. And they um, uh, go to space fully aware of those risks. And I was talking to Judy a little while ago about how different it is when you're talking about a group like this compared to the Challenger days uh, when we had uh, a civilian member of the crew, Christian McAuliffe. Is that, do you think that's different in the mind of the American people? Well, the, 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 uh, we know that, that uh, those involved in the space program are fully aware of the dangers, uh, the, the skill with which they put together the spacecraft, uh, the, the uh, precision with which the, the machinery is built uh, to avoid things like happen today. Uh, they, and it's interesting, as you know well from uh, your, your time around the space program, that our astronauts don't uh, swagger uh, through their day's work uh, uh, aground 
but they are looked upon at, but at the same time by their fellow workers who are not astronauts, but uh, in the ground crews, they are looked upon uh, as, uh, as heroes to be. Walter Cronkite, yeah, much is made of the white scarf. We use that term, but the, the white scarf is perhaps a pejorative that doesn't fit for these people who uh, fully understand the risks and, and are not out there, as you say, with that swagger. Walter Cronkite, thank you so much for being with us. You bet, Miles. Hang in there. All right. We are um, now going to turn our attention to um, a special guest who is joining on the line who is uh, enduring a particularly tough uh, morning. Uh, June Scobie Rogers, the widow of the commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger, Dick Scobie, joining us on the line now from her home in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, and June, I just, uh, it's got to be a terribly difficult thing to see this, particularly for someone who's been through what you've been through. Just uh, tell us what, what you thought and, and what it's brought back for you. Thank you, Miles. It's a tragic day for our nation for the NASA family, and especially for the dear families of the Columbia crew. Um, our heartfelt um, prayers are for them. I know that they're flying back to Johnson Space Center now and um, had calls wanting to talk to the commander's wife, and we're going to talk eventually. But uh, it's, uh, it's something so difficult because a private loss is so public and is shared with the nation. Tell, tell me, um, w without violating the privacy of your conversation, what can be said t between June Scobie Rogers and Evelyn Husband today? What can you tell her uh, to ease her pain in any way? Well, we, we could talk about the day, just getting through the day with your loved ones and friends and prayers and to know that they're in the hands of God, that their loved ones have surely slipped those surly bonds of earth. God's put out his hand, holds them. And I would want God to hold them close. There's, there's so much to be concerned about with their families, and um, I would hope that they're taking care of themselves and that the NASA doctors are taking good care of them. Um, to feel the prayers that the nation, when they say they're sending prayers, they are. And to feel the love of all of those people and to know that we care so much for them and know their loss. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's so difficult and it's such a tragedy and it's so unfair that it happened, but the world the world knows how they died, and if they can just remember and hold on to the dream of what they were living for and what their mission was all about, then that dream will see them through. Um, boy, that's, those are tough words, and I, I know you've told me many times that in the wake of, of Challenger, 17 years ago this past week, you. Uh, really not even long after the incident. We're talking to then Vice President Bush. And uh, you uh, expressed at that time your firm belief that your husband, uh, Dick Scobie, would have wanted to see NASA press on. Do you, do you feel, I, I, I know you don't know Rick Husband necessarily, but do you feel that that is the spirit of this crew? What, what dear people, yes. Yeah. I, I can, anyone who believes so much in the space mission of, of the discovery of the opening new vistas and to learning about the space frontier, you know, they're living, they're living for that um, discovery of space exploration. And they, so many of them signed up to NASA to fly in space with vision and hope and knowing that it would bring so much more information to our planet to help us. With those dreams and uh, fulfilling those dreams, they, I can't speak for the current Columbia crew, but if they signed up to fly with NASA, 
that must have been their dream that they would want fulfilled as well. June Scobie Rogers, our, our best to you on this day, which uh, must be particularly poignant and painful for you as well. And we appreciate you taking a few moments with us. God bless you all. God bless you. As she spoke, we were watching um, yet again that shot. Um, you can see it right there on your screen. Uh, somewhere um, south of Dallas, Texas, uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia, about 9 a.m. Eastern Time, was streaking across Mach 18, 200,000 feet, and just went from a single fireball to multiple fireballs in an instant. Uh, communication abruptly ended in the middle of a conversation from the commander, Rick Husband, and um, immediately prior to that, there's some indication of some problems with tire pressure. What that means, we don't know. It may be quite some time before we ever have any sense of what really happened and what caused the Space Shuttle Columbia to break up. But we've already seen the, the first steps toward uh, that conclusion. First thing that flight controllers uh, did in Houston was tell their people on those various consoles to put together their notes, capture their data, put notes in boxes, seal it up, get it ready for the investigation. Not long thereafter, we saw Sean O'Keefe the NASA administrator saying that the wheels were in motion already for an independent commission to get to the bottom of this particular incident, an independent commission that will ultimately report back to the nation and give NASA and the rest of the nation a sense of what went wrong. And then Bill Reedy, the head of the Human Spaceflight, uh, Associate Administrator of Human Spaceflight, talking about finding it, fixing it, and moving on. Moving on might, will be a real challenge for NASA, depending on what comes out of this. Could take quite some time before we see another shuttle fly. It was almost three years from Challenger's accident until Discovery flew and the return to flight. Uh, we're now in the early stages. It's a time for mourning. It's a time for questions. The answers will come much later. Judy? Miles, I, as we keep uh, showing that picture over and over again, uh, of the first sign of uh, that something was gone wrong, had gone wrong visually. I, I keep thinking how hard it is to reconcile the beauty of the sky, the beautiful crystal blue sky over the state of Texas with that white, thin white vapor trail, how hard it is to reconcile that with the awful thing that happened. And it, again, it, it reminds me of the Challenger. It, it, you know, the picture was itself was, it was spectacular. It was red and white and the blue background. And here again, a beautiful blue sky. And yet, concealing a horrific uh, accident that's taken the lives of those seven brave people. Um, President Bush learned of this, uh, we are told, just shortly after NASA realized what had happened about 9.15 this morning Eastern Time. He was at Camp David. He made his way uh, pretty soon after that back into Washington, Camp David, of course, being in the Catoctin Mountains outside of Washington and Maryland. Now you see this is a live picture of the White House, a flag there flying over the White House at half staff. And it was just about 45 minutes ago uh, that President Bush addressed the nation. At 9 o'clock this morning, Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our Space Shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. On board was a crew of seven. Colonel Rick Husband, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Anderson, Commander Laurel Clark, Captain David Brown, Commander William McCool, Dr. Kultna Shavla, and Ilan Ramon, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. These men and women assumed great risk in the service to all humanity. In an age when space flight has come to seem almost routine, it is easy to overlook the dangers of travel by rocket and the difficulties of navigating the fierce outer atmosphere of the Earth. These astronauts knew the dangers, and they faced them willingly, knowing they had a high and noble purpose in life.
because of their courage and daring and idealism, we will miss them all the more. All Americans today are thinking as well of the families of these men and women who have been given this sudden shock and grief. You're not alone. Our entire nation grieves with you. And those you loved will always have the respect and gratitude of this country. The cause in which they died will continue. Mankind is led into the darkness beyond our world by the inspiration of discovery and the longing to understand. Our journey into space will go on. In the skies today, we saw destruction and tragedy. Yet farther than we can see, there is comfort and hope. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The same creator who names the stars also knows the names of the seven souls we mourn today. The crew of the shuttle Columbia did not return safely to Earth, yet we can pray that all are safely home. May God bless the grieving families, and may God, may God continue to bless America. President Bush, uh, who spoke to the nation about 50 minutes ago, we're replaying uh, the president's remarks. The words at the end, I think we all carry with us in our hearts. The crew of the shuttle Columbia did not return safely to Earth, yet we can pray that all are safely home. I think we also should note the president said, made it a point to say the cause in which they died will continue our journey into space will go on. We've been talking all morning about, uh, in the aftermath of the, the tragedy uh, 17 years ago when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after it lifted off, uh, there was a, a hiatus, uh, two and a half, three years before the shuttle program resumed. There was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of questions raised, many doubts about whether space flight, a manned space flight in that form should continue. Now it seems uh, there is less questioning. I think there's more of an assumption that it will go on. Yes, there will be an investigation. Yes, there will be uh, investigators will go over every piece of information, every piece of data, uh, all the debris. In fact, we've just been told that the uh, Louisiana, the Air National Guard in the state of Louisiana, our Barbara Starr at the Pentagon is telling us, is broadening their search. Uh, they're looking over a very wide area, not just we know in Texas, but uh, in Louisiana, perhaps in Arkansas, uh, and elsewhere, making sure that uh, every piece of debris that came down from the space shuttle Columbia, anything that came down from that shuttle, is retrieved. We're, we we're waiting uh, for a second NASA briefing. This one, we're told, is going to be uh, more on the technical side, but uh, every piece of information is important at this point. When we know so little about what happened, we can only speculate. And I know my colleague, Miles O'Brien, in Atlanta, you've been asking some very good questions of these uh, uh, former astronauts and others who know the space program. But there have to be millions of pieces of information that have to come together before they're going to know any answers. Yeah, I think, I think that isn't an overstatement, Judy. There probably are millions of little pieces of data that which will have to come together and put this puzzle together. Uh, the first sense of where this investigation is headed will hopefully become evident to us when we hear from the shuttle program manager Ron Didimore and chief flight director Milt Heflin. They'll be joining uh, us live out of the um, Johnson Space Center in Houston, which is the home of the astronauts and the home of mission control. Uh, as you well know, they expect to be uh, addressing uh, the nation and NASA and all of us in the next five minutes or so. Uh, we expect to hear from them. A little while ago we were talking about the gaps. Uh, it was two and a half years for uh, or almost three years, really, between the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster and the flight of Discovery, the return to flight. 
it was inside two years from the Apollo 1 fire to Apollo 7, which was the, uh, the first uh, manned Apollo mission. Uh, went from January 27, 1967 to October 11, 1968. It was right in the absolute heat of the space race, and they completely redesigned the Apollo capsule in the course of that process. That was a different era. Don't expect to see that kind of um, uh, level of support. The, the funding levels are just not, do not equate to the, those days of the space race, the heart of the, the moon race. But um, throughout all of this, um, NASA will uh, put safety first. NASA has put safety, has, has put NASA's uh, safety issue, has been first for quite some time. Prior to Challenger, uh, there was a desperate attempt on the NASA's part to prove that it was an operational vehicle with airliner capabilities. And um, at that time, it became very evident uh, in the course of that investigation that NASA managers themselves were fooling themselves on the safety and ignored engineers who told them that there were serious problems uh, launching shuttles in the cold weather, and they did it nonetheless. I can tell you from my experience, NASA post-Challenger uh, does not have that attitude. And uh, every last little piece uh, of those shuttles is poured over uh, with a mind towards safety, and, and the flights are flown with safety first. They're, NASA no longer is trying to prove anything of an operational nature with the shuttle. There's recognition it still is an experimental uh, vehicle. Let's go to Nick Furman, uh, who's had some experience on Capitol Hill uh, with the space program and who has um, worked as a space analyst. Nick, let's put this in perspective from the political side of it. We were talking about how inside two years they completely redesigned an Apollo vehicle after the Apollo 1 fire, and then the post-Challenger almost three years. Is this, it's, it's hard to say, but when, how long does an investigation like this take? How long before the nation's ready to fly again? Oh, this is the day, of course, all of us dread and that NASA, uh, not the least of, of which, you know, Bill Reedy and others, work to defy and defying this dreaded day is really what running the shuttle is all about as you know i i think it could take a long time i, I believe the cause uh, that we discovered in challenger was so obscure it was a confluence of uh, of horrible accidents it wasn't just the o-ring it was where the o-ring broke and as a result of that um, you know putting those tiny pieces together looking at the one million signatures that were signed off to launch this uh, shuttle uh, two weeks ago, uh, all of the paperwork, all of the work that was done on the, uh, the Columbia orbiter recently, um, the upgrades, um, was something left behind, was a sponge left in, like, uh, you know, they worry about in surgery. All of the paperwork is going to be examined and combed through to see if there isn't some vulnerability that laid on top of yet another vulnerability. And, and that's how complicated it'll be, and it'll take a long time. When, when you talk about, and Judy used the term, millions of pieces of data, and at first I thought, wow, but that's really what we're talking about, literally, uh, as the flight controllers cart up page after page of documentation. Um, there is one thing that we can say safely. Every piece of data relating to that vehicle is now in the hands of uh, mission control. Well, I, I, I hope it is. I mean, er, every piece of data, you know, includes things like the, the, the test that was done on the glue that holds the tiles to the orbiter, uh, the, the weld inspections that were done uh, when Columbia was in for its major upgrade. Uh, you know, though that's the degree of detail and paper that's around, and it's not just at Houston or at uh, Cape Canaveral. It's, it's in California and other places and laboratories around the country where the work was done. So it's a lot to pull together. Well, it's often, it's often interesting, though, there, and you, you talk about this paper. Everything that is done uh, on a shuttle is uh, associated with paper. There's a saying that the, the shuttle is not ready to launch until the stack of paper equals the height of the shuttle stack on the launch pad. And, but what that does is it does give these engineers something to go back to and in a very comprehensive way say, this particular tile was glued on this particular way. That's right, but you know, every time something bad happens, you'll notice that all the paper was signed. Uh, you know, th there have been a lot of uh, almost terrible things that have happened in the shuttle program. One time they uh, closed up the back of the uh, payload bay and uh, went to turn the shuttle up uh, to, to carry it, to mate it to the, uh, to the rest of the stack, to the boosters, into the fuel tank, and they heard a large clunk. Well, it turns out that the scaffolding that was in the payload bay was left in the payload bay before they did that maneuver and so you know all the paper was signed yeah those things do happen we are talking about something that involves after all human beings well, it's a human tragedy 
Uh, and, but we're the only creatures on the face of the earth that actually explore. You know, animals don't go exploring. Humans are unique. We're, we're, we're one of a kind. And I think we'll keep doing it. All right, good words to leave it on. Nick Furman, space analyst, thank you very much for being with us. I'll send it over to Darren and give you a recap on what's been going on all this morning. All right, top of everything, Miles, want to remind everybody, we're expecting uh, just about now for there to be another news conference out of NASA, 3 p.m. Eastern. As soon as that does begin, you'll see that live right here on CNN. That will be the second update that has come from NASA since this tragedy occurred at 9 a.m. Eastern this morning. While we are waiting for that news conference... Years of space flight. It was the first time that a craft had crashed on re-entry. At Cape Canaveral, the Stars and Stripes are flying at half-mast, a tragedy for a nation already facing turbulent times. Not far, far high up, it's going to spread over a large area. Our Ed Lavandera is at one site where some debris has been spotted in Nacogdoches, Texas, and he turned, tells us more about that. Ed. Hi, Darren. We're about two blocks south of downtown Nacogdoches, and as we've driven in from Dallas this morning, and we have uh, crews that have gone in through the Palestine area into Nacogdoches as well, and scenes like this are, are very common throughout East Texas. Uh, this is just a small piece of debris, as you can see here. It's been roped off. A lot of people have been coming here, gathering, uh, taking pictures, and uh, all over Nacogdoches from what I've seen here. Uh, we just arrived in the city about half an hour ago and have been able to see in, in various spots where little pieces of, de of debris have been uh, roped off, uh, not only here by military folks here, but we've also seen places as we were driving in uh, where uh, I think people, farmers, had uh, roped off the area, telling people to keep on moving through. So not just the official help here in this area uh, helping out this situation, but a lot of people who just live in the, in the more rural areas outside of Nacogdoches taking it upon themselves to make sure that none of the pieces that have landed here throughout this area are disturbed, not only for the investigative purposes, but also for the purposes that you've heard the NASA folks talk about all day, that uh, th there is uh, perhaps a toxic and, and health reasons for why people would not want to touch this debris. So as you might imagine, for many of the folks here in the Nacogdoches area, a very uh, frightening moment this morning. We're joined by Melissa Rusk, who lives here in Nacogdoches. Yes. Melissa, uh, describe what it was for you like this morning. This morning, roughly about 8.03, the walls started shaking, uh, a thunderous noise booming, um, which seemed to be right in our backyard. It lasted for about two minutes, loud, thunderous noise. I've heard people describe it like a railroad. Um, it was amazing. The house shook. Two uh, minutes? About two minutes. It seemed like an eternity. It would not let up. It was uh, one thunderous clap after another, a rolling sensation. Our dogs went bananas uh, trying to get into the house. So. And you had no idea what it was? We had absolutely no idea. We called 911 and reported it since we are close to the airport, thinking perhaps an airplane had gone down. And indeed, uh, they said they'd had no report of that. We turned on CNN, and that's where we found out about the shuttle having blown apart. You've been driving around town. Are scenes like what we're showing here pretty common? Absolutely. Very common. And as you had stated earlier, every piece uh, is roped off, whether it's on your personal property, people have roped it off, or if you have the military out here. But yes, there are several areas in Nacogdoches that look just like this. Yeah, you're with your children today. What have you been telling them? Well, we had a long discussion about it, and they're excited to be part of history, only on a very sad note, of course. Um, they were shocked to hear that it happened right here in their community. Um, but they, um, they're they taking this upon themselves as a very um, educational experience. All right. Thank you very much, Melissa. So, uh, Darren, as, as you can see here, this uh, piece, not exactly sure we've uh, asked the folks here if, if they know what kind of piece of material this is. They're trying to keep people as far away as possible, so uh, trying not to cross the street here to get in their way. But as I mentioned, Darren, this is a very common scene. A lot of the pieces that we have seen are very small, quite frankly, nothing more than five or six uh, feet long in, in, in diameter and, and or in height. So, Darren, back to you. And any reports of any injuries on the ground there as the debris fell in that area? We haven't heard. Well, we had a chance to speak with some of the city officials here a little while ago as we were driving in. We haven't heard any of those reports. There have been so many reports, as you mentioned, Darren. This is a, a huge area for uh, uh, the, the authorities here to have to, to comb through for information and for any kind of evidence. So a lot of the reports have uh, sc scattered. From, from a very large area, but no, uh, no major reports of injury or anything like that at this point. And you talk about how what we're seeing there is a common scene around Nacogdoches and the area. Do you get the sense as you're able to drive around that people are respecting the wishes of authorities, not just from a safety perspective, but in order to respect the investigation that they are cooperating and staying away rather than letting the curiosity or perhaps greed get the best of them? Absolutely. We're just uh, about two blocks away from here. There is a really 
uh, a, a piece of uh, a piece of the shuttle which doesn't appear to be more than six inches long and it was on a sidewalk that someone had come around spray painted it and literally there's a huge crowd of people around it and no one would would even come would even come close to touching that little that little piece of material uh, so it was a, kind of an interesting sight on a, on a sidewalk in the middle of downtown Nacogdoches here yeah, and I don't know if you had a chance to talk with any people like this because I know you were in a hurry to get to a site where you could bring us some live reports but we talked to some folks in Dallas who were already outside because they, they knew they would be in the path of where they could watch the shuttle do its reentry and head toward Florida for its relanding for its landing. Yeah, was, I was in Dallas this morning when this happened, and my understanding is, is that some of uh, our CNN affiliates were uh, taking live pictures of the shuttle passing over because it was such a, it's such a crystal clear, beautiful day here in Texas. It was, the uh, conditions were, were supreme for uh, being able to witness the space shuttle coming over, overhead. In fact, uh, from what I understand, it was a, a, a good friend of mine who was the photographer in Dallas uh, uh, shooting the scene this morning as uh, catching the glimpses that we've been showing all morning long. Uh, of the shuttle passing over Dallas in the moment that we presume uh, everything went terribly wrong. So uh, the, the conditions were ripe and a lot of people were paying attention to this. In fact, a lot of people I heard on the radio driving in this morning, a lot of people who had woken up just to be able to catch a glimpse of what was going on. So uh, through this part of Texas, people, for the most part, pretty well aware of what was going to be going on this morning as they wanted to try to catch a glimpse of uh, the shuttle flying overhead. All right, Ed LaVendera in Nacogdoches, Texas, thanks for bringing us that part of the story. Appreciate that. want to bring our viewers' attention to some things coming up later on in the day. First of all, a special that we're putting together for you here at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, a number of our colleagues and correspondents working on bringing the latest and taking a look back at what has taken place today. Uh, that includes Miles, of course, who's been on the air with us all day long, and our space, our space expert, Wolf Blitzer, making his way to Houston to the Johnson Space Center. That's where the families are headed. Judy Woodruff is in Washington, and Lou Dobbs, who happened to be in Florida, the right place, he will be joining us live from the Kennedy Space Center. Once again, that'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific tonight. Once again, we are standing by any moment now. The latest update coming from NASA, 3.15 p.m. Eastern. You'll see it live right here on CNN. Right now, we toss it right back over to Miles. All right. And and uh, that, that's obviously an important briefing, which we're going to see. And the minute we get it, we'll bring it to you live. I want to uh, tell you a little bit more about what we were seeing there. Um, that picture we've been showing you over and over again uh, occurs after a very dramatic return from space. 17,500 miles an hour, six or seven times faster than a speeding bullet is the speed of a shuttle in orbit. Uh, the process... And, and, don't want to get too deep in the world of Newtonian physics here, but basically an orbit is a, is a free fall. It's a free fall which perfectly balances the right amount of speed against the gravitational pull against the spacecraft. And it's just the sweet spot. That speed of 17,500 miles an hour is just enough to keep the uh, spacecraft in a more or less a constant orbit. Um, and I won't get much deeper into the orbital mechanics than that for fear of losing you, but that is basically... And what happens is... And let's go to the animation from our friends at Analytical Graphics. If we could put that through the telestrator, I'd appreciate it. Uh, what happens is the shuttle turns with its, uh, its back end uh, facing the direction it's going. It fires some rockets to slow it down. Then it does this pitch over maneuver and begins its precipitous fall to Earth. What you're seeing there as you look at these little thrusters, that's how it uh, controls itself before it reaches um, the, the air of the atmosphere, which then allow the wings to take over and those control surfaces. As it comes down and encounters the atmosphere, its first taste of the atmosphere, if you will, at 400,000 feet, it pitches up very nose high. And the idea here is to present these black tiles on the bottom side to uh, the heat, because those are the more hardy tiles. And uh, they are the ones that take the real um, uh, weight of the matter uh, as far as the heat dissipation. You're trading speed for heat. And in beneath those tiles, and there are some 20,000 tiles or thereabouts, beneath them uh, is the aluminum frame of a shuttle, which would melt with the 2,000 plus degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you notice, it's because these steep pitching motions, uh, right before this breakup over Houston, it was taking a steep 57 degree left turn, just like this. And uh, that pit, those S-turns are part of the process of slowing it down, getting it ready uh, for its final approach to the Kennedy Space Center uh, in Florida. It was in one of those steep left turns immediately prior to the breakup. It was, uh, was a steep left turn. Now, um, let's get um, Randy Avera with us uh, back on the, on the loop. Uh, Randy, I hope I 
correct me if I've said, misspoke there, first of all, you're a former engineer, or one, once an engineer, always an engineer, I suppose. Always you're, an engineer. You're an engineer. Did I say anything wrong, and can you elaborate at all on this process of re-entry and how violent it is? Absolutely, and, and once again, this is true rocket science, and it is a complex blend of many sciences. The uh, tremendous momentum, the kinetic energy of the, of the mass times the velocity of an orbiter entering the Earth's atmosphere, uh, there, there are many thermodynamic and aerodynamic physics taking place there. Uh, the banking left and banking right is what's referred to as a terminal approach energy management phase of the reentry, T-A-E-M. And what that is for is to, as you said, to provide the aerodynamic dynamic braking to reduce the tremendous momentum and to uh, ease into the atmosphere. They're, they're complex. Uh, Randy, I'll tell you, I want, to, I want to point out one thing here as we look at the bottom here. There is a, any one of these tiles, if one of those tiles comes out, you've got, it doesn't take much to cause a serious problem. Those tiles are, you know, can be held in your hand. Uh, one tile in the wrong place can cause a real problem, can it? Being lost, that is. That is correct. The tiles on the bottom, the black tiles, and the gray leading edge surface called reinforced carbon carbon, the very high temperature leading edge of the wing and up on the nose cap, are very critical to the uh, performance and control of the vehicle. Uh, there's another important point. The orbiter has been uh, coming through the atmosphere, taking on a tremendous heat load. And if any lateral maneuvers, the banking to the left, the banking to the right, are conducted, and this is part of the normal flight profile, but what that does, it adds a, a, an instantaneous large heat load in addition to the heat that's already been put into the orbiter as a capacitive heat load. And so if you have any flight control issues where you uh, go laterally too far to the left, too far to the right, there's a limit at how, what uh, a banking rate can be safely conducted. Right. But it's worth pointing out here, Randy, that at this juncture, the uh, commander is not actually hand flying the vehicle. This is flown on autopilot. The only time that the commander actually takes control is on the very final stages of approach, once it goes subsonic, about 50,000 feet, just before turning in for landing at the Kennedy Space Center. This is all controlled by computer. That is correct. And uh, STS-3 was one of the very first and only uh, landings where uh, automatic landing was uh, conducted. Uh, but the normal flight uh, entry into the atmosphere is computer-driven and controlled. And, uh, of course, there's the manual capability that both the left seat and the right seat commander and pilot have. And the 50,000-foot altitude is directly over the shuttle landing facility uh, in, in Florida or in California. And then a 270-degree turn to the left or right on the heading alignment circle is conducted to bring it on the final approach, which includes a, uh, an approach a pre-flare and flare and touchdown and rollout. And it's, it's amazing how precipitate it is, is from that point, about six times steeper than a commercial airliner's approach, 17, 18 degrees versus uh, three degrees. L uh, let me ask you this, um, the, the, these banking maneuvers, they are controlled by computers on board the space shuttle. It is not required for the space shuttle to have communication with Earth in order to accomplish that goal. In other words, it's kind of uploaded. The shuttle is an autonomous craft, correct? That is correct, and during reentry, the physics that's taking place, the atmosphere is ionizing, uh, stripping off electrons, and a, a, an electromagnetic uh, plasma is formed around the orbiter, blocking transmission of, for example, UHF uh, radio transmission. So it's typically the well-known blackout period, loss of uh, signal, loss of communications. And as I was watching the reentry today, uh, there was no acquisition of COM or navigation uh, data. Well, and was... Randy, it's, it's worth pointing out that typically with the satellite communication that the shuttle now has with the TDRS tracking data relay satellite, you don't even see that so much anymore. or hadn't seen those blackout periods like you had in the earlier days of the shuttle. Yes, you're referring to the on-orbit operations and the network of TDRS satellites by the way, Tidris was the main cargo in the 51L Challenger vehicle uh, back in 1986. And this network is for on-orbit operations, uh, communications from the orbiter to the Earth and vice versa, or from the orbiter to the space station 
or other orbiters uh, if you have, say, for example, two orbiters in orbit at the same time. Uh, and I just want to point out to our viewers, we've been telling you about a, a briefing uh, from NASA and the shuttle program manager Ron Didimore, the chief flight director Milt Heflin out of Houston. Um, obviously, uh, there you go, there's a live signal from NASA TV. 2.20 Central, 3.20 Eastern Time. We're about two minutes away. We'll bring it to you live as it happens. Um, Randy, the, um, the issue of uh, reentry and, and it's uh, the dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Is, is, is that as much stress as it encounters throughout the whole course of a flight, or does that happen on launch? Well, the orbiter structure is limited by design to 650 pounds per square foot on the actual applied load of the atmosphere. That's for uh, boost to orbit and reentry, but you also have the thermal effects of boost to orbit, which is considerable, and the very considerable heat loads during reentry. Both the aerodynamic pressure loads and the thermal loads have to be combined in analysis to determine what kind of stress the vehicle is, is experiencing. And plus, different payload configurations that may be inside the payload bay have an effect on the total mass and the flight response of the vehicle. All right, we're getting into some fairly deep technical waters here. Um, uh, we hope, to, hope we aren't losing people on all the technicalities of this. But as we go through this, I guess we'll all be schooled in a lot of this to some extent, just as we all became schooled in what an O-ring does and how when it is cold it doesn't perform as it should. Um, once again, just tell us what's going on inside NASA right now, uh, what the process is. We talked about preserving the data, all that kind of thing. What's going on right now at Mission Control? Well, from my personal experience being lead structures engineer for the orbiter for 14 years, we literally built those orbiters and knew them right to the rivet, Joe Bolt, and Hylock. Uh, the people that are being called forward to do the investigative work, NASA is a, a fabulous leader in knowing how not to contaminate the investigation, to put people on the investigation who had no decision to launch or for example, no particular responsibilities necessarily in the flight control and reentry, and just to provide a check and balance to do a good, honest investigation. Uh, those teams will be formed. The, the NASA management team at all centers are going to be involved with this. Uh, there are going to be changes in schedules and work routines, and uh, people that never had an idea, as myself in 1986, that we would be doing a crash investigation will find themselves recalling back what they learned in school and uh, college and other areas of uh, scientific expertise. All right, and we just saw the uh, screen at uh, NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center indicate a, a 225 Central, 325 Eastern, so five more minutes before that briefing begins where we will probably delve into some of the technical aspects of this. Um, tell you what, Randy, if you could sit tight because I want you to be listening to this briefing for us and um, help us in case uh, we need a little technical expertise. I wanted to touch another base uh, sitting right beside you is Mike Brooks, who is our um, law enforcement expert. And we haven't talked about this in quite a, a while, but I want to restate this because uh, obviously viewers are joining us all the time. Um, the first thing on a lot of people's minds, and I'm getting a lot of emails with people with all kinds of suppositions on this, is the issue of terrorism. Mike Brooks, uh, do us a favor and knock that down one more time for us. Absolutely, Miles. Uh, speaking with law enforcement officials, the FBI today, and, uh, and the government has come out and said that there is no indication whatsoever that this tragedy is terrorism related or terrorism had anything at all to do with it. So I just want to make, make that perfectly clear. I'm glad you did that again, Miles, just to make sure that people just join us. Uh, first thing to think about nowadays, and especially because there was an Israeli astronaut on board, uh, on board the, uh, the Columbia, that this has all the indications that it has nothing, nothing at all to do with terrorism. All right. What, uh, what are you hearing from law enforcement sources about the whole process of securing debris over this huge, huge area, a huge task? And um, another thing we, which we haven't said in quite some time is that we, we want to give people a little caveat, a little warning on all this. Right, Mike? Absolutely, Miles. And, and yet, as you said earlier, if anyone comes across any debris at all, any piece, no matter how small a piece, how large a piece, leave it alone. Call 911, let your local authorities know where it is, the location, what you see, but don't go up and touch it. As you, as you pointed out earlier, Miles, and it's very important for people to understand this, that there are a lot of toxic, toxic substances that could be 
uh, on those pieces of debris, residue, those kind of things. And it's spread over a large, large territory. We're talking possibly Texas, Arizona, Oklahoma, Louisiana, uh, New Mexico, Miles. And right now, the, about three hours ago, FB, the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, their headquarters, put out an alert to all of their 56 field offices, uh, putting all of their agents who are members of the evidence response team on standby should they be needed to assist. Now, keep in mind that the Federal Emergency Management Agency is the lead agency for the debris recovery efforts. And they wanted they will coordinate with local, state, and federal law enforcement, federal, state, and local law uh, officials around that whole vicinity, as well as the military. We, uh, we know already that there are some reserve units out there. We just saw Ed Lavendera's report. Uh, from Texas where we do see some military personnel out there securing the scenes. So it's a coordinated effort with the Federal Emergency Management Agency as the lead agency for these recovery efforts. Miles? You know, it's, um, as we send it over to Nick Furman, who's sitting uh, beside you there, uh, Mike, not only is this potentially dangerous, but wouldn't it be a terrible shame if somebody decided to take, in a sick way, take a souvenir, and perhaps that's the piece that could have solved the puzzle. That, that's exactly right. You know, I, please, I, and I want to stress this to our viewers, don't let your ghoulish curiosity get the best of you. Yes, you know, uh, this, this is a very important thing. These aren't souvenirs. This is evidence. Miles? Nick Furman, what are your thoughts at this point um, about uh, what we can anticipate uh, hearing from NASA in the next hours, next few days? Well, certainly, uh, you're going to hear what they believe the flight track was and so on. There's some practical issues, I think, that have to be addressed and one is certainly uh, what's going to happen to the astronauts who are on the International Space Station you know there's a crew up there um, there's probably not a good way to pick them all up at once using a shuttle at least not for the next year or so all right but we, we should point out Nick they have a Soyuz capsule sitting there it's essentially right, their escape raises... pod if they needed to leave they could right yes and I, I think it, it's a whole issue of whether you want to abandon the space station if you have the the, the, you know, are we going to make that kind of a turn at this point? It's really way too early to, to say, but I think that, that's something that needs to be addressed uh, by NASA up front uh, as to how we're going to deal with this over the next couple of years. Yeah, and, and the space station does change the dynamics significantly. We didn't have, obviously, an, an occupied space station in the days uh, of Challenger, and that um, may impact a lot of decision-making uh, as we look at let's look at a picture of debris here that we want to just show you it Nick I'm, I'm, your thoughts on that how that might impact um, just a still image that we've gotten of just one of met, what are probably hundreds of pieces it's, of space it's hard to, to say exactly what that is it, obviously most people are going to be very interested to get to the crew compartment in the mid deck uh, and try and locate it yeah. um, biggest problem could it survive intact Nick it, it could, depending on exactly how, how it was breached, uh, yeah. wh whether the breach occurred back in the airframe or around, uh, you know, the wings of the shuttle, or whether it occurred um, uh, further forward where some of the comm was lost initially. And so, it, you know, it's way too early to know. Hopefully we'll get some, uh, we'll be lucky and have some pictures of, of this uh, as it occurred from some national security assets or some other assets that may, be, uh, may have been watching it at the time. Let's look at that picture one more time. One thing we didn't note, uh, for our viewers, you notice the red, white, and blue ribbon, the red roses or carnations, I guess, in that case, uh, marking the place. Uh, Mike Brooks, uh, there's a phone number we're putting on there. And uh, we've been telling them call, folks to call 911. Uh, NASA is putting on a number as well. I guess either will work, right? I'd say either will work, yes. But uh, since it is spread over such a large area, I think it's important that, uh, that our viewers know this particular number. And it's, it's on our screen right now. It's area code 281-483-3388. This will take you right into the Johnson Space Flight Center. Now, they only want you to call that number if you have seen or you have found any debris that you feel is part of the shuttle, uh, as part of the Columbia, please call that number. Again, that number is area code 281-483-3388. Miles? Let me, um, uh, Mike, um, we are, by the way, momentarily, we should be seeing uh, this news conference to begin at uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Shuttle program manager Ron Didimore, uh, the chief flight director uh, Milt Heflin, uh, let's take it back to um, Randy, uh, Randy of Avila. Uh, Randy, um, we were talking earlier about this piece that struck the orbiter, the left wing, as it rose to orbit. Um, 
uh, that particular piece might have been a piece of ice, might have been a piece of foam from the external tank. It's a problem NASA was pretty aware of and has been a problem in the past, hasn't it? The launch environment, uh, ignition of the main engines and then uh, six seconds later, ignition of the large solid rocket boosters, it's about 125 decibels of noise and vibration as well. So anything that's really not secure at the pad could impact the orbiter. There's also a Venturi effect created by the, the large flow rate of the flame coming out of the solid rocket boosters and the main engines that tends to draw a vacuum down into the flame holes and into the flame trench. And that can actually uh, transport loose objects down along the orbiter, down along the external tank and boosters. But I say again, uh, the, the first step in making a wrong conclusion is to speculate. And uh, I understand that you asked that because uh, I have also confirmed through telephone calls to the Kennedy Space Center that that has been a concern this week. Yeah, they were looking at it. The people I talked to uh, put it on the level of, of low-grade interest. Uh, well documented, well researched as it always is, but the, the final thought was that uh, it didn't cause any significant damage. Uh, NASA has an ICE team, for example, that inspects during the countdown for safety to launch. The beanie cap, the little white cap on the very top of the external tank, is retracted just a couple of minutes or a minute or less uh, prior to launch, uh, somewhere in that very uh, end of countdown. And there is a possibility of ice reforming. I was at the Kennedy Space Center for this launch, and the weather was just extraordinarily beautiful. But you're talking about hydrogen at 400 degrees below zero inside the external fuel tank, in the base of the external fuel tank, and liquid oxygen in the top of the fuel tank at minus 283 Fahrenheit. So it's a thermos bottle with tremendously cold temperatures so the atmosphere around the day of launch, the time of temperature, is a secondary question as, as in regard to the temperature inside the external tank. All right, Randy Avera, stand by. Uh, we want you to listen to this briefing with us. Let's go to the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, who is speaking right now. Not sure precisely where he is, maybe Austin. Let's listen in. I want to reemphasize a note of caution to all those living in North and East Texas and into Western Louisiana. Uh, if you spot shuttle debris, do not touch it, do not go near it. Uh, shuttle materials could pose a grave risk to human health uh, because of the toxic repellents uh, used aboard the space shuttle. If you find debris, please call local authorities immediately to tell them of the location. This information also can be reported through a toll-free number, 800 Five two five 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 five. All right, we're we're going to go now to Kyle Herring, uh, and ultimately Ron Didimore, screen left, uh, Milt Heflin, screen right, NASA's Johnson Space Center. Let's listen to a more technical briefing, and then we'll throw it open for questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron. I'm sure you understand how difficult how difficult time this is for us right now. We're devastated because of the events that unfolded this morning. There's a certain amount of shock in our system because we have suffered the loss of seven family members. And we're learning to deal with that. There's certainly a somber mood in our teams as we continue to try to understand the events that occurred. But our thoughts and our prayers go out to the families of Rick and Willie, David and Kalpana, Michael, Laurel, and Alon. True heroes. And we are suffering for the events that have happened this morning. As difficult as this is for us to do, 
we wanted to meet with you and be as fair and open with you given the facts as we understand them today. Uh, we will certainly be learning more as we go through the coming hours, days, and weeks. We'll tell you as much as we know. We'll be as honest as we can with you. And certainly we'll try to fill in the blanks over the coming days and weeks. As difficult uh, a situation as this is, we are moving forward. We have established a number of different teams. We have contingency plans for the, just these types of events, though we never expect to use them. We, had, we have implemented these contingency plans. We are preserving data. We are beginning thorough and complete investigations. We are mobilizing our forces, our engineers, our technicians, our safety and quality, our best experts to try and understand what went wrong. I do want to take the time right now and express my appreciation for the tre tremendous number of agencies that are coming to our aid from across the country, both federal, state, and local, that are assisting us in our recovery operations. I also want to express my appreciation to the public for assisting in the recovery, for notifying us of different debris, where, where it is located, that we might get to it as quickly as possible. It's also appropriate that we tell the public to be careful with the debris. What we fly in space is uh, operated in many cases with toxic propellants. And some of the debris may be contaminated. So we need to be careful. And we don't wish any harm to come upon anybody that would be honestly seeking to help. At this hour, we have not positively identified any items that we have recovered. Uh, we are staging in an attempt to ensure that all recovered items are managed appropriately. But at this stage, I haven't received any real information on debris uh, or status of crew remains. I can go back to the uh, start of the day, filled with excitement and anticipation. Today was a great day to land in the Florida area. We had uh, all positive indications that it was going to be like every other day where we have landed in Florida. Good weather, anxious team to welcome a fantastic crew back families that were excited about welcome, welcoming their loved ones back, and no indications at all of any impending threats to the vehicle. The first indications of a potential problem occurred minutes before 8 o'clock Central Standard Time. The first indications were of the loss of sensors, temperature sensors, in the hydraulic systems on the left wing, both the left inboard and left outboard Elevon temperature sensors. They were followed seconds and minutes later by several other problems, including loss of tire pressure indications on the left main gear, and then indications of excessive structural heating. And uh, Mr. Heflin will talk in a minute about uh, some further details. I have to caution you that we cannot yet say what caused the loss of Columbia. It's still very early in our investigation and it's going to take us some time to work through the evidence, the analysis, and clearly understand what the cause was. But what we are doing is we are impounding hardware 
so that we can preserve evidence. We have stopped processing at the Kennedy Space Center. We are preserving hardware around the country in our different facilities. We are impounding data here that represented the last data that we received from the crew. And we'll, we will be pouring over that data 24 hours a day for the foreseeable future. Again, I express our sadness to the families for their loss. And we'll do our best to answer your questions. Okay. Thanks, Ron Milt. <clears throat> First of all, um, uh, just some personal uh, observations and comments to begin with. <clears throat> and then I'll review some, uh, some data with you. <clears throat> um, this is a uh, this is a bad day. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad that I work and and live in a country where we have when we have a bad day, we go fix it. Um, Ron said we'll fix it. I can talk to you some about uh, uh, what went on in the flight control room with uh, the entry uh, flight control team under the guidance of flight director Leroy Kane. Ron said it was a good day to land. In fact, many of us, as we came in today, were marveling at the fact that Leroy Kane did the ascent as well. and. And probably the most difficult things that we deal with during launch attempts and entries is dealing with the weather, as, as you all are accustomed to. And we marveled and, and felt good about the fact that, you know, launch, we didn't have any weather issues to work. In fact, any weather issues anywhere in the world that we were concerned about. And, and today, it was a very minor thing to talk about, some fog, I believe, but nothing really hard to work. So, as Ron mentioned, this was a fantastic mission and, and just seemed to be coming to the right conclusion. Um, just some specifics for you, and bear with me. This is relatively recent, fresh information, and, and as you can imagine, in the next several hours and days, this will be, we'll get closer to, to, to many details, I'm sure. Um, Around 7.53 a.m. Central Time, as Ron mentioned, we saw indication of um, um, off-scale low measure temperature measurements on the left, the inboard and outboard the hydraulic systems. And, and, and this was loss of the temperature measurement. It wasn't, uh, wasn't any indication that it was high or low. We just lost it. Um, about three minutes later, around 7.56 a.m., uh, in the left main gear, tire wheel, well, uh, brake line, and, and tire temperatures, there we saw an increase. Now, I, I need to tell you that during this time, the vehicle was performing fine. We had no indications of any, of any problem. Around 7.58 a.m. Central Time, a couple of minutes later, we have what we call bond line temperatures. These are temperature sensors that are embedded in the structure of the vehicle. We have them, we have them all over the orbiter. Um, three of these temperatures on the, again, the left side of the vehicle, um, the left wing area, the off-scale low reading again. This was not high indication, low indication, but they were, we lost the, we lost the measurements. I don't have the seconds here. Clearly, seconds will play a part in our analysis, but I'm giving this to you at the nearest minute. Around 7.59, then Central Time, um, left inboard and outboard tire temperatures and pressures uh, off-scale low. Um, about eight, 
eight measurements total during that time. One of these, one of these measurements uh, uh, sent on board by the computers gave the crew um, a message, indication that they could look at on their displays. Um, and they, they, we think they were acknowledging that measurement that they saw. Again, the vehicle was flying with no problems at that time. And when things like this happen, when a crew gets an alert, it's a, you acknowledge it, they, they recognize they've seen it, and then we go, we do what we might need to do with it. And as far as I know, that was the last transmission from the crew. I can't, I've asked a couple of people, I haven't heard the tapes myself, I, I'm not sure what they, what they said at the time, but they were acknowledging, we believe, that that indication that they'd seen. Then we lost all vehicle data. Um, it looks like it was around, um, and I apologize, I've got, it looks like my little Cheat sheet here doesn't have the last central time on it, and I'm not going to try to convert it to you at this point. But it's around 8 o'clock, central standard time. Um, altitude was 207,135 feet, and traveling at uh, a Mach of about 18.3. And the flight control team um, during this time, uh, again, uh, we lost the data, and that's when we be clearly begin to know that we had a bad day. That's all I've got. Okay, thanks. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of uh, centers uh, around the agency that are involved today, so we're going to try to limit the questions to one and uh, try to get through as many as we can. I need you guys to do me a favor and uh, when you raise your hand, wait for a microphone and please give your name and affiliation first. And we're going to start here in Houston and then uh, go around to the other NASA centers. So uh, let me see a show of hands and we'll try to get somebody to you. Let's start, just start right here on, uh, along the front row uh, and work this way. Hi, Melissa Jacobs with the Fox News Network. Where will the debris be taken? We haven't uh, yet identified a central location. Uh, part of the activities that, uh, that are ongoing, even at this very moment, is to stage our teams into a location in uh, uh, northeast Texas. Uh, we are still identifying the locations for our teams to uh, to meet and gather and, and start this process of recovering deb debris. And uh, part of their first activities is to identify the staging area, the collection point of all the debris. So that's some work that's going to be done uh, later on today. The teams are, are, let's see, they're not quite in the air. They're staging right now at the different uh, airports, and they're converging on northeast Texas. Uh, and so that's some work that's still uh, in front of us. Sig Christensen, uh, San Antonio Express News. Um, at this point, uh, what is the status of the shuttle program and particularly the, the upcoming missions are you going to have? Have you decided to uh, put all of those missions uh, on hold? And do you have any kind of idea how long the program will be out of service? Well, of course, this thing happened just this morning. And, and uh, we, we put in motion uh, some stop work types of activities. As I mentioned earlier, we've, we've uh, minimized our processing at, at the Kennedy Space Center so that we don't do anything that might disturb some evidence. Uh, we, we are also slowing down our manufacturing processes in, uh, in the Michoud facility in Louisiana where we manufacture the external tank. We're doing that in different areas around the country for different pieces of hardware. Uh, what this slowdown means as far as the launch schedule is yet to be determined. Um, we also will be having an, uh, an investigative board outside the agency, as mentioned earlier by Mr. O'Keefe, that will come in and, and, and help 
resolve the situation to everybody's satisfaction so that we clearly understand what was the root cause of the problem. And once we, once we get on a path of understanding the root cause, then we'll be better able to say whether it affects future flights. If we can put, put it off to the side and, and get it narrowed down and say, okay, we understand the root cause, here's the things we do about it or need to do about it, and then accomplish that corrective action on, on the other vehicle flows, then we'll be able to pick up our flight progress again. How long that's going to take, it's too early for me to tell, but uh, I do believe that uh, we'll continue to meet with you and keep you informed of just how this is progressing. Um, I've talked to uh, Mr. Bill Gerstenmeier, who is the program manager for the International Space Station program. They have scheduled, a, they had a previously scheduled progress launch tomorrow, uh, and that progress launch will proceed as scheduled. They have reviewed the contents that are going to be shipped to the space station, and those contents are appropriate given the fact that we may not be there for a while. Um, they have enough consumables, supplies for the crew to go through the latter part of June without having a shuttle visit. So there's some time for us to work through this. Uh, and get back on our schedule and we're just going to have to work through that in the coming days and weeks and we'll keep you informed on, on just the impact to the manifest. But right now, there is a, certainly there is a hold on uh, future flights until we get ourselves established and understand um, the root cause to this disaster. My name is Jenny Blankenship. I'm a reporter with the CBS station in Austin. And um, I was wondering if, if you could explain to, to people who are not from this area really how tight-knit of a community this is, not just here on the NASA JSC campus, but all around here, how much of a, an integral part of the community this is to you all. Well, it's, it's more than a job. This, this is a passion for us. Human spaceflight is a passion. It's an emotional event. Uh, and when we work together, we work together as family members. Um, and, and we treat each other much that way. And whether it's the loss of a crew member or a loss of a member of our ground team or processing teams, it's a sad loss for us. And so we are a very close community. We understand the risks that are involved in human spaceflight. And we know that these risks are manageable, but we also know that they're serious and can have deadly consequences. And so we are bound together with the threat of disaster all the time. And we know we must count on each other to do what's right. We must count on the ground teams to process correctly. We must count on our suppliers to follow the procedures just like we have identified to them. And we count on the flight crew members to fly the vehicles within the specifications. So we all rely on each other to make each space flight successful. So we have a dependency. And it's a professional dependency and it's an emotional dependency. And so when we have an event like today, where we lose seven family members, it is devastating to us. Uh, and it's more than just us in this location. There, there is an emotional attachment to human space flight. It, it uh, piques our interest, it captures our imagination. Um, I received a couple of phone calls this morning, immediately following uh, immediately following the, uh, when it became apparent that Columbia was no longer going to land, one phone call was from my brother in Phoenix, Arizona, not associated with the space business. I haven't talked to him yet, I just received a message, certainly extending his thoughts and prayers. I received another phone call from my son in Provo, Utah with the same emotional outpouring of sadness. 
And I'm sure this is true across the country. We're seeing that from the public. We're seeing that as people that really care about the space program and understand what it means to this nation reflect their thoughts, their prayers, their caring attitude to us. And, and we want them to know we appreciate it very much as we struggle with our emotions in this difficult time. We appreciate the thoughts, the prayers, the care, and the support. Milt, you might have some thoughts also. Well, um, yeah, it, it is a, the, the community out here is, is extremely close knit. Um, <clears throat> I've been through three of these. Um, and, and each time uh, you see a coming together of, of the community here, our landscape has changed. <clears throat> the space flight business today is not going to be, it's going to be much different than it was yesterday. It was different after the Apollo 1, it was different after Challenger. And it was different because this community, the passionate, Ron's right, the passion is here. And, and as Ron was talking, I was thinking about your question and I thought, you know, sometimes it's a shame uh, that it takes things like this for this country to pull together and, and, and care. And, and it shouldn't. Damn, we're good. This country's great. It shouldn't take these kind of things to cause a coming together. Okay, thanks. Uh, Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Milt, you mentioned about eight sensors and one of those which triggered some kind of notification inside the, inside the shuttle. Um, can you tell us which sensor that was and whether it was an abnormal reading on whatever sensor it was or whether it was just that the sensor was no longer functioning? There were, <clears throat> in the left inboard and outboard, th these, are these are tire temperatures on the left-hand side, okay? Um, um, temps and pressures, and Ron, help me out here if I, if I, if I get that mixed up. Um, and, and they they all went, they all went what we call off scale low. In other words, there's a bottom number zero, or maybe not zero, not necessarily zero, but there's a bottom number of the measurement. They all just went off scale low, indicating um, loss of the measurement itself. You know, um, and and I cannot tell you specifically which one of the eight. Uh, we'll find that out, but I don't have that right now. No. An, e an easy way to think about that is the measurement was no longer reading. It was not yeah. giving an indication. It's, it's as if someone just cut the wire. Okay, right over here. Chris Heinbaugh with WFAA-TV in Dallas. Uh, you indicated that at 7.53 was the first, uh, you first lost some sensor uh, information, and you indicated towards the end, there was an acknowledgement from the crew. During the rest of that time period, was there any dialogue, any communication with the crew during that period? And was, if there was, was there any indication from them uh, that there was a problem uh, that they could see on board? Uh, at, yes, at 7.53 a.m., uh, we did have a, another set of um, four measurements uh, in the hydraulic system on the left-hand side that went off scale low. Now, this was reported by the um, uh, flight controller responsible for the mechanical and hydraulic systems in the orbit reported to the flight director. Um, w when this happens, then it's followed up by if there's any action to take, if there's anything that we see that needs to be done, that flight controller will tell the flight director and a crew and, and call might go to the crew. Uh, these were measurements that did not <clears throat> have, um, we, have many, we have many measurements on board. Not all of them are enunciated to the crew. They don't need to be. Uh, and we see a lot more information on the ground than they do. So they did not, did not see this. So they had no indication. We saw nothing else to indicate any difficulty at all, because had we seen anything else, we would have taken some action. That's, you know, we work, we work very hard. We train very hard 
to react in a very short amount of time to situations. Um, but we don't, if, if, if we don't have anything that we see that we've got to do, then we don't, we don't spend the time talking about it because we focus on the next event and so forth. Right here next, next to him. I'm Brian Sasser, KPRC TV here in Houston. We had heard some reports that <clears throat> during launch there had been some concerns that some debris hit the wing. Uh, is that true and is that any cause of concern and that, that could have caused today's problems? Uh, it is true that uh, right after launch, and I don't remember the time frame as far as uh, seconds, there was a, uh, a piece of foam that is used as insulation on the external tank in the area of what we call the uh, bipod, which is the forward attach uh, between the orbiter and the external tank, there is a piece of foam that, uh, that was shed. And in our review the following day of the launch films, we, we saw this piece of debris drop off. And uh, it, it looked to us like it impacted the orbiter uh, on the left wing. Where on the left wing, it's very difficult for us to tell. Uh, somewhere between the mid and outward span. Um, was it the leading edge? We don't know. Was it underneath the leading edge? We really don't know. To the best of our ability, that's what happened. We spent um, a goodly amount of time reviewing that film and then analyzing uh, what that potential impact of debris on the wing might might do and, and would there be any consequences. Uh, through analysis and through our ability uh, to, to call back on our experience with tile, uh, it, was, it was judged that uh, that event did not represent a safety concern. Um, and so uh, the technical community got together and across the country looked at it and, and judged that to be acceptable. And so as we, as we look at that now in hindsight, uh, that impact was on the left wing. Um, and certainly we have all the indications that Milt talked to you about were on the left wing. We can't discount, discount that there might be a connection. Uh, but we have to caution you and ourselves that, uh, that uh, we can't rush to, rush to judgment on it because uh, there are a lot of things in this business that look like the smoking gun, but turn out not even to be close. And so uh, we really have to do some regression analysis. We've got to look at what Milt described, you, described to you and then back up in time through analysis to see if we can piece together the events and whether or not this was a tile problem or whether it was a structural issue or some other event. We don't know yet. What will help us determine that uh, is, is inspecting the debris. That will really help us. And so we're very anxious to get certain pieces back to look at. Uh, and that will determine whether or not this particular event, whether it was the debris hitting the orbiter or some other event, was a cause of this problem or this disaster today. OK, get that gentleman right back behind him. Ryan Korsgaard from KVUE TV in Austin. You talked a little bit about the hardware. What goes forward now with the astronaut training? Does that continue? Does that stop? What happens? Well, there's going to be a, a period of uh, mourning in this community. There's going to be a period where we're just going to get together and support each other and hug each other and, and help us go on. Uh, but we're going to fix this problem. We're going to get back on the launch pad. We're going to launch shuttles again as soon as we're ready. The training is going to continue. The best therapy in this business is to get on with your job. The best therapy in the flight control world is to get in that control center and train for the next mission. The best therapy in, in the flight crew world is to continue with their training. Stay focused on the job ahead. Stay focused on what we need to accomplish, and that's what we are all going to do. There's going to be a subset of us that will be working together to resolve this problem. And we will do that, and we will do that 
quickly, efficiently, and we'll do it safely, and we will not fly again until we have this understood. In the meantime, life goes on, training goes on. We'll start manufacturing hardware again as soon as we know that we have preserved evidence. So in, in a few days, I suspect we will start pulling things back to what we understand and releasing certain activities to start up again. But in the next several days, it's going to be a period of quiet, of reflection, and where are we going to go from here as far as what we need to do to resolve this issue. Okay, Greg, let's work on the second row. Start right here on the end. Rash Rashonda Tate, Fox 26 News. Did you have a device on board that is the equivalent of a black box? Uh, no, we don't. We do not have an, a, a, a hardened black box data recorder or voice recorder. We do have recorders. We do have recorders of both data and voice. Um, if they survived the, uh, the entry and the impact, we will certainly look to see if there's any information there. Uh, as Milt mentioned to you on the timeline, he, he talked to you a little bit about these sensors that just kind of quit working. We also know that during this time frame, the vehicle was operating perfectly. It had gone into a roll reversal, which is a standard maneuver where the vehicle banks left or banks right. It's a standard maneuver, and when it does so, it does so to bleed off energy, and you do a number of these roll reversals so that you land at the right speed right at the Kennedy Space Center. It had rolled itself into a roll reversal, and everything from a flight control perspective was perfect. No indications of any problems. So we have some indications that it wasn't a vehicle loss of control issue, uh, and so we're getting some hints of where we need to go look. Um, whether or not these recorders survived and will, get, and will be useful to us, uh, I'm not really sure that's going to be the case. Okay. Anybody on the next person with his hand up there? Jake Dyer, Fort Worth Star Telegram. I have a couple of questions. Um, regarding the, whatever it was, the foam that uh, apparently fell off the, uh, the vehicle at takeoff, was there any consideration during the flight that perhaps an EVA would be necessary that you guys need to go out and take a look? Secondarily, I, uh, I'm wondering about you guys talked about uh, loss of sensor readings and sort of unusual sensor readings. Could you give us a sense about how unusual that is? I mean, is that, do you, is that, does that happen with any frequency or is that, was that something that was alarming that you'd never seen before? Um, the easy answer um, is the uh, sensor reading and yes, that happens. The fact that you have a sensor that just quits working is not an alarming factor. Uh, in fact, we understand that several sensors can quit working and uh, they're all result of not the sensor quit, quitting to work, they're a result of a box, an avionics box, a signal conditioner, or a uh, multiplexer demultiplexer that happens to fail and its signature to you and me is the fact that it looks like someone just cut the wire. Uh, and we've seen this on occasion and we certainly trained for it many, many times over. So it is not unusual for us when we see it to look at it and immediately start to understand whether it is a single sensor problem or it's an avionics box. The team today looked at it as they are trained to do and could not see any common thread between this sensor and, an, and another sensor. There's nothing common about it and so that made it more significant. As soon as we understood it wasn't a common avionics box and that there were multiple sensors, all completely independent, um, and all this happened in a very short period of time, we knew that something was not right. Uh, now, you asked me something else on the, uh, on the phone. Uh, the idea of the spacewalk. All the spacewalks. We do not have the capability to perform a spacewalk and do tile repair. We do not have the capability, as you know, when we go out of the spacecraft, we operate really within the confines of the payload bay. On this particular mission, there was no remote manipulator system. There was no arm. Uh, 
and so all we had trained to do from a spacewalk perspective were those things that might be an emergency or a, 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 a latch did not work in the payload bay door closing sequence or something like that. We can go outside and make sure the payload bay doors are closed. We have no capability to go over the side of the vehicle and go underneath the vehicle uh, and look for a, an area of distress and repair of tile. We, we know we have no capability. If for some reason we thought we had a tile problem, the, the risk you take when you launch is that you may suffer a tile issue. We have no capability to repair it. All we can do is, before we launch, design robustness into the system so that a loss of some tile capability will not result in loss of crew or vehicle. Uh, does that answer your question? We have no capability to do that today. At this point, that the impact of that ET debris on the tile was the cause of our problem. We convinced ourselves as, as, as we analyzed it 10 days ago that it was not going to represent a safety issue. Now, we had the events of this morning. We're going to go back and see if there is connection. Uh, is that the smoking gun? It is not. We don't know enough about it. A lot more analysis and evidence needs to come to the table. So it's not fair to represent the tile damage as the source. It's just something we need to go look at. Uh, yeah, grab right there next to you. No, no, right here next to yeah. you. Gina Treadgold with ABC News. There are reports from an astronomer at Caltech that the shuttle was, uh, debris was flying off the shuttle as early as a flyover in Owens Valley in California. How does that match up with this timeline, and are you aware of those reports? It's news, isn't it? Well, I haven't heard that uh, report. And sometimes as you uh, go through entry and are in a plasma, sometimes you see plasma. It looks like debris, but it's really not debris. It's plasma. Uh, it's just the fact that you're going really fast through the atmosphere. Um, if, if he saw something over Hawaii, uh, recognize we flew a good long while before we got to the Texas area. Uh, and, and so it's, it's doubtful that we had something uh, in Hawaii that would cause us a thermal concern. Uh, at the time that we believe we lost the vehicle, as Mild explained, it was about Mach 18, or 18 times the speed of sound. We were at our peak heating. We were at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the wing leading edge. And uh, if we did have a structural problem or a thermal problem, you would you would expect to get it at the peak heating, not back at Hawaii when you weren't suffering any real thermal uh, environment, extreme thermal environment. The, the most extreme thermal environment was right at Mach 18, and that's where we lost the vehicle. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Dinmore and Gesselman with Newsweek. You mentioned in your um, opening comments that, that there was indication of excessive structural heating when did that happen in the timeline um, from 7.53 and on? And secondly, at any point between 7.53 and 8 a.m., were the folks in mission control worried? Let's see, you respond about the mission control. Let me talk about these bond line temps. We mentioned that, and I might have overstated it when I said excessive heating, because as I look at the notes here, the bond line temps on the left side of the vehicle were off scale low, which means it looked like the, the rest of the measurements, it looked like they had been cut. So uh, I, pro I probably misspoke on that by saying excessive heating. It really is that we lost those measurements too. Um, the mood uh, in my area where I observe the flight control team uh, was uh, it was very upbeat, and then we started to understand a little bit about these multiple loss of sensors. We recognized there was no commonality. We lost voice with the crew. We lost tracking data. We had no TV. As we came to find out later, there was, we saw the um, TV reports of debris. We did not have that at the time. 
And so we were very anxious because we knew we were in an area of good communication coverage. Uh, we were in an area where we should have tracking and we had lost both and as we started adding all these up, the, uh, we were certainly most anxious. Look at this gentleman right behind you. There you go. Ron, Thayer Evans from the uh, Daily Oklahoman in Oklahoma City. Um, can you confirm reports of debris in other states besides Texas, namely Oklahoma, and also offer your thoughts on Mike Anderson? I can't confirm any debris in Oklahoma, and I would doubt any debris in Oklahoma because our ground track was basically just north of Dallas on a path that uh, went through uh, northeast Texas, Nacogdoches area from, from northwest to southeast. That's going to be the ground track. That's going to be the, the interest of our search. Mike Anderson, uh, I suspect you asked me because uh, we are both from the same hometown. Um, Mike and I, uh, we have a common backgrounds. He uh, attended my rival high school. Um, he graduated from Cheney High School. I graduated much earlier than he did, I'm sad to say, but uh, uh, from Medical Lake High School, and we were arch rivals. And he and I had a good uh, communication going about, about that. He was a, he grew up on uh, an Air Force base, Fairchild Air Force Base, Spokane, Washington. I also grew up on Spokane, Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. He went to the same grade school I did. We had a very common early beginning, but I, I told him that I, I was his pathfinder. And uh, so we had a good relationship. And we talked many times about how he had met his wife in Spokane. I also met my wife in Spokane. His parents lived there, my parents lived there, my wife's parents lived there, a lot of commonality. I'm gonna miss Mike. I'm going to miss the closeness that we had. Reach this person right there. Sanjay Bhatt, Cox News Service in Palm Beach Post. We heard that earlier today that th this crew was very passionate about the work they were doing, the scientific experiments that they were conducting, and uh, we heard that they wouldn't, that their loss would not be in vain. What I'm wondering is the, how many of the experiments aboard, in terms of the data being collected required that the astronauts and the craft return safely to Earth. And uh, because there were some new laboratory modules on this craft, is there anything to suggest that those could have uh, contributed at all to what we saw? Well, <clears throat> I, Ron, I don't have the answer to it. Maybe you do on the number of experiments that we, uh, that we have to have the return of the heart. I don't have that. I'm sure we can get that for you. Uh, and I can't imagine space have being on board back in the cargo bay had anything to do with this. Let me just uh, say something about the science. This vehicle on orbit, we kind of pinched ourselves over the past 16 days. This vehicle performed flawlessly, absolutely flawlessly. Science was, uh, was a premium. The folks on the ground were just ecstatic with the amount of science that they were reaping, and they were looking forward to getting much of that information back on the ground. Certainly some of it was uh, downlinked to the ground prior to entry. Some of it was, will be their legacy. Others uh, had to come back and be analyzed in which that particular part of the science would be lost. But it was an amazing mission. And uh, we were ecstatic over the results and looking forward uh, to talking to the crew and telling them what a great job they had done. And so it, it is a painful experience for us to lose our friends and, and recognize that things were going so well and turned out so badly. Valor Time Magazine, could you share with us the last words that came from the crew? Well, I, a while ago, 
the last transmission that we got was, um, it had to do, I think I, a while ago I discussed that there was a measurement that gave an indication to the crew and an alert that they acknowledged. Uh, I, I can't tell you what they said at that time. I don't know what the word was, but it, 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 was, it was the sort of thing that, that when something like that occurs, that the crew's response is fairly typical just to let the ground know we see that. Uh, that's the, how, how the routine works. And, and uh, that was the last transmission uh, from the crew that I am aware of. And I think as we go, you know, as we go through um, and, 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 and peel this apart, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have more, more information like that that we can share with you. Okay, I got time for two more questions here before I need to go to the other NASA centers. Grab this gentleman and then this young lady on the next row. Elizabeth Lee with KHWB Television. Um, a brief loss of communication, has that happened before during reentry? And if so, when you did lose communication, was there still hope that perhaps it was just brief? And at what point did you realize that it was something more grave? We lose communication from time to time for uh, various reasons. We certainly lose it during the orbit phase. We've lost it sometimes for a whole revolution of 90 minutes. Um, on entry, though, we, we understand that any dropouts generally are brief. Uh, and if they do occur, they occur during the peak heating time frames when the plasma around the vehicle as it is uh, at its maximum extent. And so a brief uh, dropout at this time period is, is no reason for us to be concerned. Uh, our experience is we gain it back fairly quickly. Our concern at this time was that uh, as we made several calls to them, they did not respond. We made several more calls to them via UHF, which is usually as reliable as anything, and they did not respond. Uh, and it became apparent to us that uh, we were in difficult circumstances. Okay, last question right there. Go ahead. When you guys first got that anomalous sort of readings where you were unclear of, you know, something strange is going on, at that point, was it, uh, was it a situation where you guys were committed? I mean, there was nothing you could have done about it. As soon as, when you first saw those readings that the, the uh, you know, that you, things went blank or whatever, was there any, any corrective action whatsoever at that point that you could have done? Nothing that we could do. Just observe and see if there was any, going to be any future downstream impact to the landing. Uh, in fact, if, this, if that's all we did was lose those 12-odd sensors, no impact to this flight at all. We'd have come back and repaired the sensors. They don't impact the flying qualities of the vehicle. They don't impact the insight into, uh, into how we control the vehicle. All they do is provide us information on how the systems perform so that when we turn around the vehicle for the next flight, gives us indications of where we should look. Um, did not affect and would not affect the flight given just the sensor by itself. Okay, let's go to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for questions, please. Uh, yes, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Um, Ron, I have a written report from earlier in this flight that there was a potential for a large damage area to the tile, and given that, I'm wondering how and why was it deemed, uh, deemed minor by NASA? And do you have any idea how much of a damage area may have been left on the left wing and how big that piece of foam was that came off? We have a pretty good idea how big the size of foam was. Uh, what we don't understand very well was what the actual impact did to the tile. And so we have to use our analysis and uh, our engineering expertise to help us understand how a piece of foam of certain weight and density impacting the wing at certain velocity, what it does to the tile. And our experts gathered together, and we've, we have people in this system that have worked on these tiles since the beginning of the program, and we understand how the tiles function, we understand the tile's ability to withstand damage, we understand the thermal characteristics of the tile both on the surface of the tile and at the base of the tile. And as we, as we got together and reviewed this information, we were convinced 
technically and analytically that the tile would not, the, the impact of the debris on the tile would not represent a safety of flight issue. In fact, we were anxious to come back and get the, the handheld film that the crew takes as soon as they get to orbit uh, of the external tank as it's moving away. We asked them to take pictures of the external tank so we can understand exactly where the foam was shed from the tank. And we were anxious to get that piece of information because we felt that we needed to analyze it so that it would not occur on future flights. We, we have a flight readiness review coming up for the next flight. Uh, it was scheduled for February the 20th, and we knew we had some technical work to do to make sure that uh, we understood why this piece of debris came off. We were not concerned with Columbia. We felt we had analyzed that. And we felt we uh, uh, understood it such that it was not a thermal concern to us, did not represent a control issue or a safety of flight issue. And I, again, I'm going to caution you that, um, that that is the case today. We have no information that would say that is not the case. We are going to go look at it again. Uh, to see if there is a connection between what Milt talked to you about and the fact that we had a debris impact on the tile. Uh, and there's some other things we need to go look at. The tile is just one. And, and so uh, we were satisfied that we did the proper work. Uh, and across the community, our safety, our quality, our crew members, our flight controllers, and the program management reviewed the technical analysis and agreed to a person that it was not an impact to this flight. So we need to go back and look at that, of course, but that's the events as they unfolded. Hitler from Florida today. I, uh, I'm sorry to ask another question about the external tank, but has this happened before? Has foam come off the tank? Has it impacted the shuttle? And what were the consequences that you saw? We, we had an ev event on STS-112 just uh, several flights ago where a piece of debris from the same general area was shed by the tank. And this particular debris, and, and I can't tell you today whether it's of the same general size, but it came from the same general area. And uh, it impacted the, uh, the aft skirt on one of the boosters. Uh, superficial damage occurred. When we got the booster back in port and looked at it, evaluated it, um, reviewed it technically, discussed it at the following flight readiness review, which was STS-13, we as an agency, as a shuttle program, uh, decided that that did not represent a technical safety risk to us. Uh, we have, from time to time, uh, debris. Ice can come off the tank, um, uh, frost, pieces of debris, and they impact the bottom of the vehicle. Uh, several years ago, we had, we had a, a problem where we were, as we were, uh, during the launch phase, we were uh, popcorning pieces of this insulation on the tile, it would effectively reach a certain point in the ascent, and it would popcorn out and impact the bottom of the vehicle, and it would cause damage to the tile, but not damage that was a concern from a safety standpoint, damage that when we got back we had to repair or maybe replace the tile. We have subsequently fixed that problem, and as we were looking at this particular problem of, of debris shedding in this one bipod region, region on STS-112, uh, we said, well, we've got an area that we need to fix, and we have a turnaround discussion, but not a safety of flight issue. We flew STS-113. We didn't shed any external tank debris. On STS-107, as we looked at the films on the following day, we saw the same type of debris being shed from the same location. In this case, it didn't impact the booster. It impacted the left wing. So again, two occurrences in the last three flights is certainly the signal to our team that something has changed. It did not represent on the first occasion uh, an alarm from a safety point of view. 
it represented a turnaround processing issue. As we go forward in our investigation, we're certainly going to look in this area and, and determine whether or not this was a contributor to the loss of Columbia and the loss of the crew. This is Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. Ron, could you talk a little about who all and what all was involved in the analysis of the tile issue after launch? Did you ever give any thought to using telescopes to look for signs of damage to the orbiter? And if you had detected um, extensive damage to the TPS, is there anything you could have done with the angle of attack or anything else uh, during reentry to have reduced stress on that part of the vehicle? The easy part of that question is there's nothing that we can do about tile damage once we get to orbit. <clears throat> we can't minimize the heating to the point that it, that it would somehow uh, not require a tile. And so once you get to orbit, you're there and you have your tile insulation and uh, that's, that's all you have for protection on the way home from the extreme thermal heating during reentry. Um, we have experience in the past of uh, having events that have occurred that have occurred that would that we have assessed using other assets to maybe get a close-up look at uh, the bottom of the orbiter. Recall uh, a year or two ago we lost the drag chute door uh, right at liftoff. It fell off, and uh, we actually tried to take some pictures of the back end of the vehicle to see what was really there so that we can understand our thermal heating in that case. And those pictures that we received were not very useful to us. So that was part of our background. Combine that, our feeling that we didn't believe the pictures would be very useful to us with the fact that there was not much, there was zero that we could do about it. And in this case, we elected not even to take the pictures. We believe that our technical analysis was sufficient. We couldn't do anything about it anyway. We were in the best possible position. And so we elected not to take any pictures from any other sources. And that's the way that played out. Uh, Ron and Milt, this is Craig Cavalt with Aviation Week. I'm trying to understand, uh, especially at the first event, the 753 event, specifically where those sensors are located uh, relative to the, the wing structure or the main body structure. Can you describe that in a little more detail? Yeah, please? they were located at the left inboard elevon and the left outboard elevon. And, and recall, the elevons are at the back part of the wing. They're the trailing edge of the wing. And the impact, if you were trying to relate tile damage to the elevon, the impact was, of course, on the front edge of the wing. Uh, you, you can't draw any conclusions from this yet. We can't. Um, it's just data that we need to go pour over and understand. Uh, if you looked at the sequence of events, Craig, you would see that our first indication was left inboard out, left outboard, which is the trailing edge of the wing. The next indication was um, left main gear wheel well, which was, it's like it's moving forward toward the front of the wing. But that doesn't mean anything at this point because how we lost the sensors was it looks like we just cut the wires. It could be that the wires were being lost at some other location, not on the trailing edge of the wing. And so we've got to piece all this together. There's we, we can't say today that there is some significance that the indication started at the trailing edge of the wing and worked themselves forward. We can't say that. Just like we can't say that a debris impact on the front of the wing, a tile, is any reason to conclude that we lost the vehicle. It's just information that needs to be factored in with a lot of other evidence and analysis. Lots more work to do. Uh, Stefan Pelleda for the New York Times and Popular Mechanics. Um, Ron, I noticed after the disaster, a couple of hours after, that there was a large number of mission controllers uh, standing for quite some time in the control room, and it looked like they were listening to somebody addressing them. Who was it, and what was uh, the discussion ongoing? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. We. Um, 
we are very fortunate here in the agency, uh, and in particular here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, to have people uh, in our employee assistance program, specifically Jackie Reese, who runs that um, program. It is a program to help employees um, deal with uh, situations like this. Um, as part of our response to this, uh, Jackie, Jackie called in and, and made herself available. So prior to releasing the uh, entry team, both the, the front room, the room that you see on TV, and the people that support in the back rooms, we had everybody gather in, uh, in that room. That's what you saw. And Jackie Reese was giving them about five minutes of, of what the, they should do as, uh, as a human being who has gone through something like this. As you leave work and you go home, um, giving them some assistance and also providing her office to be available if anybody individually needed any help. So that's what you saw. Uh, I'm glad she did it. And she's available to help us, and, and we will need the help in the next several days and weeks. And let me add something to that, too. Uh, our communities and our workforce are grieving right now. They're grieving at Marshall in Alabama. They're grieving at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. They're grieving here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. They're grieving at many of our installations around the country. And uh, this particular uh, effort will help us get through difficult times for those that really need some extra help. And so we appreciate that service. This is Jay Barbary with NBC. You said early in this uh, briefing that you had some hints for the problem may have developed. Could you uh, share those with us? CJ, I don't recall whether I said I had hints. All I, all I know is the data that's available to me today, and, and that is these, these sensors. Uh, it's interesting, they kind of work themselves forward from the trailing edge, but I remind myself that's, that may not be the facts. Um, I have indications of a debris impact on, the, on either the leading edge or the wing leading edge of the vehicle. Uh, I, say I have some areas that I know I certainly want to go look at, I have some debris that I'm anxious to see, to see if that would lead me down a particular path of investigation. It's one of several that we will investigate. Uh, and it's just too early, Jay, for, for me to speculate on, on where that's going to lead. Uh, as you know, we will be thorough, methodical. To be a pain in the neck, we will be, to make sure we understand it. Uh, and it's, it's going to take us some time, some days, some weeks to pull it all together. This is Phil Chen, Earth News uh, for CNN. Uh, sorry to meet you guys under these circumstances. But for Milt, can you give us the time? I guess you have an admission lapse time when you last lost the, the data, and I, I can do the conversion, and describe what the vehicle was like at that point. You said roll reversal. You gave us the altitude and velocity. Was it under autopilot? Was husband controlling it? Uh, uh, what would it have been going through at that point? Uh, Phil, I can probably give you part of what you ask. Uh, the MET of um, MET of loss of vehicle data. Well, let's see. Let's, thank you, Ron. We'll back up here. We had just completed roll reversal number one. It was completed at an MET of 15 days, 22 hours, 17 minutes, and five zero seconds. Um, and he wants the altitude. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was 224,390 feet, Mach of uh, 20.9. The, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we, we had no indication of any control problem um, prior to loss of data. So from a vehicle standpoint, other than the, what we've talked about that we, we saw with, with telemetry measurements, um, we had nothing to indicate the event that occurred. In hindsight, you're looking and say, well, these things will probably tie together somewhere, but we just haven't done that yet. Loss of vehicle data was at 15 days, 22 hours, 20 minutes, 
22 seconds, altitude 207,135 feet at a Mach of 18.3. Um, and and I, don't, I can't answer the rest of your questions yet. This is Jim Banky of Space.com, uh, I guess, for Ron and Milt. Um, can you talk about the uh, issue of uh, uh, Columbia being NASA's original orbiter, the oldest orbiter, how the age issue may or may not be a factor here? And just out of curiosity, was any of the original instrumentation uh, still on and active that may or may not help you with additional data point? Columbia was an amazing machine. Um, it, it was the first space shuttle vehicle to fly into space. This was its 28th flight. Uh, it wasn't the most experienced vehicle. Discovery has 30 flights, at least 30 flights, if I remember it right. Uh, so um, I don't think age is a factor. Uh, if, if you ever have the opportunity to look at any of our vehicles, you'll see that the vehicles are, are kept in just pristine shape. Um, a lot of tender loving care goes into the, to the care of our vehicles so that they, uh, they look brand new. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't areas of wear. There certainly are. There's certainly areas of corrosion. That's our job to manage that corrosion and manage that wear so that we continue to fly these vehicles safely. Uh, Columbia, because it was the first vehicle, had, an, had a lot more instrumentation uh, included in its design and uh, in its structure than the other three vehicles. And uh, several years ago, we elected to take out much of that instrumentation because it was no longer being used. And we reduced the weight of the vehicle almost 1,200 pounds just by removing instrumentation and the associated wiring. So uh, there really is no extra instrumentation there that would add to uh, our detective work. Uh, and what was there before we took it out was not being used. Uh, Bill Hart with CBS News. And for both of you, we certainly appreciate you uh, appearing here today. I know it's difficult. Uh, could you tell me, please, Milt, um, if you told the station crew, I'm sure you have, what's happened, when, when that happened, and what uh, Commander Bowersox and the rest of the crew might have uh, said in response? Uh, Bill, I, um, I'm not able to tell you when it happened, nor am I able to tell you the response. Um, I was clearly not focused in that. I, I know we can get that for you. I can give you the general time, Bill. It happened prior to 9.30 Central. This is Irene Brown, and um, I also wanted to express my condolences to you and your colleagues. Uh, you mentioned, Milk, that um, Americans often wait for a tragedy to come together, and we saw a substantial boost in NASA funding after the Challenger accident. Um, for Ron, I was wondering if you could uh, say what you'd wish to come about as a result of this tragedy, and how much of a hardship would it be if you have to fly the shuttle manifest with just three ships? My thoughts are not on um, what I hope to come out of this tragedy, tragedy. My thoughts are still on what happened this morning. My thoughts are on seven families, children, spouses, extended family. My thoughts are on their grief. My thoughts are on what we missed, what I missed to allow this to happen. It's going to be a difficult day for all of us. Uh, Dan Billow with WESH TV. Uh, Ron, a, a two-part question. The, the first part may be a little repetition, but I want to make sure that I get it clearly. Do you have any indication at all that there was excessive heating on any part of the uh, space shuttle, whether it was wing or, or tires, uh, landing gear? And secondly, uh, 
Might, would there be a possibility that there's anything associated with the bipod that could have come off that is hard along with that foam? The, the first part of the question is, uh, no, we really don't have any information that says there was excessive heating. And so when I said that earlier today, I misspoke. All we do is have information that says the sensors quit working. Uh, and if we do have evidence of excessive heating, uh, excessive heating occurring, I will get back to you and let you know. I, I think we're going to hold some meetings with you on a fairly regular basis over the coming days, and I will bring you up to speed on if anything that I said today was erroneous, and certainly as we get new data, I'll let you know. Uh, as far as the bipod area, we believe it was foam. Uh, we do not believe it was any metal. We don't believe there's any opportunity for any metal to be shed. Uh, and in fact, our films show that when this particular debris impacted the wing, there was a puff, puff of debris, like when it hit, it, it disintegrated itself. And um, so I, I don't believe there's any, uh, any chance that it was hardware, it was all the soft foam insulation. Jerry Hennepin, uh, Time Magazine. Is there any indication from what you learned so far, Ron, in this uh, incident, that uh, maybe the uh, stress, uh, we're maybe overstressing this uh, space plane in the role reversal process? I think at one point, the left bank had got up to 57 degrees. Yeah, that, that is not uncommon to have that type of roll reversal and bank angle. And in fact, we've seen a lot more, a lot uh, steeper banks than what you just mentioned. Uh, we'll have to go back and look to see if that is a factor. Uh, that'll be part of our uh, gathering the debris, inspecting that debris, and seeing if there's anything there that would give us a clue as to whether this was structural in nature, structural failure, whether or, or whether it was thermal related or some other. Uh, so um, we're going to have to be uh, some detectives and look at the, the debris and, and gather that evidence to determine what the cause was. The Long Miami Herald, if you had had a sudden break in the heat envelope or, or sudden heating, would that have knocked out the sensors or would you have expected to have seen a, a heat measurement before they quit working? Well, it's certainly speculative uh, to try and understand the relationship between any thermal environment on whether an or, and whether that thermal environment would have translated into a, uh, an area of wiring and then destroyed wiring. Uh, hard for us to respond to that question today. Um, I'd be glad to take that question in the coming weeks as we get some information where I can respond to it uh, factually. Yeah, yeah you, you know, you, you guys are... You guys are trying to help us, and we thank you for that. I mean, you're, you're, you know, the, you can continue to ask questions like this, but you know, anything that everything would be a speculation, and that's not fair. It's not accurate, and I know you want to be accurate. Well, let me let me interject because we're also uh, need to recognize these two gentlemen have been um, on duty since about midnight last night. So I want to uh, bring up a point that we are going to do, try to do briefings daily, at least daily. Uh, so please try to um, form your question appropriately uh, so we can get through today. And I need to get them out of here fairly soon. So I need to wrap up with KSC as quickly as possible. I've got some other NASA centers to get done also before I wrap up. So let's make two more at KSC and then move to headquarters, please. Uh, gentlemen, first let me offer my condolences. I'm Robert Pankow from WFLA Radio. If you can, uh, can you tell us all how the families are holding up under the circumstances, the families of the astronauts? See, we don't have any first-hand knowledge, and, and I believe earlier in the day, Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. Reedy talked a little bit about how uh, the families reacted, both uh, with our administrator and uh, with the phone call from our president. So uh, I don't have anything to add other than what was said previously. Yes, hello. This is uh, Philip Davis from National Public Radio. I was wondering if after the loss of communications, did you notice any uh, deviation in the flight path of the shuttle? When we lost communications, we also lost our ability to track the vehicle. 
And so we had no indications whether or not uh, we were off the flight path. We had no indications that we had a breakup. Only later, as we reviewed the TV coverage, did we see that there was a breakup. And, and, you know, in the control center, just to share with you, um, we have, a, we have a plots of the trajectory and how we're flying. And, and I, and I know others, stared at that for a long time uh, because the tracking ended, you know, over Texas, stopped. And uh, it was, and I, and I reflected back what I saw with Challenger. Okay, let's go to headquarters, please. There's questions there. This is Frank Mooring at Aviation Week. Uh, for Ron, could you give us an idea of what your investigators are going to be looking for at Nishud and when they're going to start looking? <clears throat> we had already kicked off an effort, even prior to this morning, uh, to try and determine why the debris was being shed from that bipod region of the tank. Uh, and, that, and the reason we kicked off that effort, because we knew we needed to understand it prior to the next flight. So we were already aggressively on a path that, 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 was helping, that was going to try and help us understand whether or not that represented any concern to us since, since now we had it two times in, in the last three flights. So that was a major element in our, in our planned flight readiness review for STS-114 that's scheduled for March. So that activity was already in place, already ongoing. What we have done today is asked, asked our external tank project team and Lockheed Martin, which is the contractor for the tank, who builds the tank in Michou, the Michou facility in Louisiana, to isolate certain pieces of hardware, uh, to gather data, uh, that might be pertinent to uh, this discussion and to make sure that we have not put in jeopardy any piece of evidence that might be helpful to us. So we've taken those steps, those are in place or are ongoing right now, and we'll be able to uh, keep you aware and, and uh, tell you what's happening in the coming days if, if there's anything that comes out of this. Charles Science, Science Magazine. What are the contingency plans for the International Space Station in the event of a grounding of the shuttle fleet for an extended period of time? All I know today is that um, I've, I've talked with our station uh, program management. They have been in contact with all of the international partners. They understand what happened today in the shuttle program. Um, they are going to proceed as planned tomorrow to resupply the station via the Progress vehicle. Uh, there is a Soyuz launch that is planned uh, later in the spring, and we know that we have sufficient consumables on board to go through the end of June without any shuttle support. Uh, beyond that, I have no further information. Uh, I hope that we get this situation resolved in the coming weeks so that it isn't an extended period of time, but that remains to be seen. In the near term, we know we have months of uh, adequate supply on board the International Space Station, and we also know that we can help resupply them from our international partners' resources. So that's what I know today, and uh, we'll see how that matures over time. This is Laura Meckler from the Associated Press. Could you tell us any more about how you'll approach the recovery of all the debris that is spread over such a large area and what the NTSB's role is going to be in that? or what their role is in the, in the investigation, and also how long you think it'll be before you know more about what happened today. We have ma many government agencies that are helping us respond to this tragedy. Uh, the NTSB is at our disposal. We have the FBI that is involved with us. We have local and state law enforcement. Mm -hmm. We have FEMA that is also helping us tremendously we, uh, we have been assured that we will um, have the, uh, the assets and the efforts of, the, uh, uh, of our government to help us wherever we need to uh, gather debris, get it in the right locations. 
identify uh, any crew remains, get them to the right locations. Um, all that is ongoing. It's, it's being organized. It's, tr it's a tremendous effort that has been engaged and is in the process of coming together from all different agencies in different parts of the country. Uh, I don't have much more information other than those ingredients today. Uh, as, as these things come together, uh, and as we start basing and we start collecting, I'll keep you informed on just how that is going and where these things are happening. And uh, certainly we'll respond to your questions as this moves along. Simona Chatterjee with Night Ritter Newspapers. Um, are there any satellites that NASA, the U.S. military, commercial uh, satellites out there that might have caught what happened and we could be looking at images from other satellites? And just about the debris as well, um, you mentioned earlier um, that you were anxious to see certain types of debris. What types are you anxious to see? And are first responders um, trained for the recovery of such hazardous material? Well, we were anxious to see the, uh, the pictures of the tank. As we separate from the tank uh, roughly eight and a half minutes after launch, we have the crew immediately get out of their seats and use some uh, handheld uh, both still and motion picture video, uh, take some shots of the tank as we're separating it from it. And we do this on a routine basis because that's our only evidence of what the tank looks like after it got to orbit. Because the tank goes about a half an orbit around the Earth and re-enters through the atmosphere and is destroyed. So we have no physical evidence other than film. And uh, what we were anxious to see was that film, to see uh, if it looked uh, similar to what we had experienced on STS-12 where we shed some debris from the same area. Obviously, we're not going to get that information. So that's what we were looking for. Um, and if you asked me any other parts of that question, I've forgotten what they were. That's all right. Lisa Sylvester with ABC News. It looks like judging from the TV reports, what's, uh, what you've been finding are these smaller pieces of debris. Is it, is it NASA's intention to try to gather as much as possible uh, and then to try to rebuild the shuttle much the way they did with uh, TWA Flight 800? I don't know for a, for a fact, but my impression is we're going to gather every piece we can find, treat this much like an aircraft incident, and see if we can solve the puzzle. Um, that's not going to be very easy because, um, because when we had this vehicle break apart at 200,000 feet in Mach 18, it was at peak heating, and, and some evidence uh, may have burned up during reentry. Other evidence is just spread over such a wide territory uh, th that we may never find it. So we hope to get as much as we can, piece it together as experts think best to help us solve the puzzle. Okay, let's go to the Marshall Space Flight Center, and let me make a, another plea to limit your questions to one, and I've got 15 more minutes for this briefing, and I'm cutting it off for the day, re recognizing we are going to uh, offer briefings uh, at least daily from here on in, so let's go to Marshall. Jennifer Morgano, WVNN Radio. I understand the Marshall Space Flight Center managed to keep opposing elements of the shuttle. What specific involvement will the center have in the investigation? They, along with every other center, will be actively involved. We'll have their key managers, their technical experts, all coming together, uh, much like the teams we formed when we solved the flow liner problem of the summer and the recent Bistra crack that allowed us to launch SDS-107, the resolution of that issue. So we're going to pull together the management. And we've already had meetings with the center directors. We've already had our meetings with our our management at headquarters. We're already assembling the technical experts and the teams. Uh, and, and so we're going to make wide use of their best and brightest to solve this problem and uh, try to understand what happened uh, and put in the proper corrective action. 
Bill Johnson, WHT in Huntsville. Can you tell me if you learned anything from the investigations of Apollo 1 and Challenger that will help this investigation uh, proceed more quickly? I, I think the, what we are implementing today is a process that has been tried uh, over time. And um, many of what we are, many of the procedures that we are implementing today uh, were a lesson learned or an outgrowth from previous uh, incidents. And, and so we're uh, learning our lessons, we're putting them into practice, and what we have put into place today is a result of previous lessons learned. Um, just a side personal note, it is, it is our mantra or our, our personal effort to learn the lessons of the past. It's mandatory reading for us to read the reports from the Rogers Commission on the Challenger accident. We study them. We understand them. We try our, hard, our hardest never to repeat the problems of the past. And uh, it was all of our goals never to have to sit here in front of you and describe these events again. And uh, we're very disappointed it's hard to tell you how disappointed we are, how saddened we are at this event, and uh, somewhere along the line, we miss something. Or we're going to learn something new that we couldn't do anything about. But I guarantee you, we're going to fix it. Kent Falk, Birmingham News. Uh, could you tell me who is on NASA's rapid response team from Marshall, what the role will be? and what role Marshall is playing in the foam debris investigation from the inter external tank? Well, there's many superb technical experts at the Marshall Space Flight Center that are going to be involved in this investigation. I don't have at my fingertips today the names of those individuals. Uh, if we judge it appropriate in, in the coming days to release that, we certainly will give that information to you. Shelby Spires, Huntsville Times, Huntsville, Alabama. Can you tell me who's leading this investigation from a center perspective? Is it, is it coming out of Johnson or will it come out of another center? Uh, no, actually, this is being led as a one NASA activity. We have a mishap investigation team uh, that is a standing team in case we have events like this happen. The uh, chairman of that mishap investigation team is Mr. David Whittle. He is a trained individual in mishaps. Uh, he has gone to NTSB school. He works very closely with the other agencies. He is NASA's commander on the scene. He is the one that's leading our effort. He is on his way to our staging areas and he will be our prime interface with all the other agencies to help us resolve this problem. So. Um, just, just a talented, marvelous team that uh, we'll have pulled together to go do this. Uh, and it's a team that is named prior to each flight, standing ready just in case we have to do just these types of things. Uh, hopefully, we never plan to use them. In this case, they're trained and, and we have pressed them in the service. Okay, let's go to California to the Dryden Flight Research Center, please. Hi, Nikki Jackson with KCBS Channel 2, KCAL 9 in Los Angeles, also representing all my colleagues here in uh, California. Uh, there have been 49 landings here at Edwards Air Force Base. When the Challenger disaster happened, it's my understanding that there was a two and a half year hiatus. You have mentioned within this press conference that future flights might be held. Can you tell me what the impact of today's terrible events will have on us here at Edwards Air Force Base? Well, I suspect they're not gonna, you're not going to feel much impact at all at the uh, Edwards Air Force Base complex. Uh, Edwards is used as our secondary landing site in case we have bad weather in Florida and do not have sufficient consumables to attempt to get into the Florida 
and Kennedy Space Center uh, facilities. Um, recall in Challenger, one of the reasons why it was such a long delay was because we had to do some hardware redesign to make ourselves, uh, to get ourselves the confidence that uh, we were safe to fly. That hardware redesign was necessary uh, to be implemented, to be developed, to be tested and certified, uh, and that took some time to do. We'll just have to see how this particular tragedy uh, works through the same type of, of uh, engineering and technical scrutiny. If there is some hardware change, we'll just have to work through that, and we'll work through that with the, dealing with the requirements that keep us safe to fly, a development, a design, certification, testing type of process. Too early yet to say whether or not that's going to be the case, uh, and we'll, just, we'll, we'll let you know how it proceeds. Okay, let's go to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for one question. Soraya Fidel with KCBS KCAN Los Angeles. Thanks again for taking our question. How is NASA responding to the family? What has NASA told the family? And what are families saying today? How are they reacting and responding in light of all this? I believe earlier in the day, Mr. O'Keefe made a statement that reflects the reaction of the families uh, and their uh, heroic um, manner that they took the news and and I, I don't want to add any more than what has already been previously stated as as to their reaction and they they will have a a huge they'll have a huge amount of support you can guarantee it from um, from this family here and this family across the nation one final question from the Langley Research Center. Uh, Chris Dovey with the Richmond Times Dispatch. Um, how many tiles in a given area of uh, surface, specifically the area where the sensors were located, uh, could be lost before that might cause some catastrophic breach um, of that surface? And what do you do in, in flight if you have that catastrophic breach and you know about it prior to reentry? I really don't know how many tiles. I can't really respond to that question here today. Uh, and I mentioned earlier to you that um, we have no capability to repair a tile. Uh, our only recourse is to design this vehicle such that we don't lose tiles, is to design this vehicle so that we can take debris impacts and not represent a safety concern. It's been our experience that we have lost portions of tiles on the bottom of the vehicle. We have had a number of uh, debris impacts, damage to the tiles. They have all um, been acceptable in that they do not represent a safety of flight concern. We would like to get uh, a harder tile to make, make it more resilient to debris, but it has not to date represented a safety concern. Um, and we have no recourse if we lose tiles. Our only effective action is to prevent the loss of tiles through design and through test, and that has been perfectly adequate up to this point. Okay, that's the final question for this briefing, and let me end and close on a couple of programming notes for folks uh, watching. Uh, there will be a B-roll package for the STS-107 mission that will follow uh, this briefing immediately. Uh, the next briefing that we will hold is likely to be around noon central time tomorrow, but uh, that's a very tentative time uh, because there are some, um, obviously some management meetings that these gentlemen are, are taking part in uh, that will occur bef prior to that tomorrow. So uh, right now we're looking at around noon central tomorrow for the next briefing here. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, folks out there that are that may be uh, discovering some de debris from the accident. NASA has established a uh, telephone hotline, also an electronic mail address for the public to use for reporting information that may help in the investigation uh, of this accident. Uh, the telephone line, and, it, and you guys can certainly help us in this regard, is 281-483-3388. Uh, 
the website uh, that right now uh, should be online for uh, folks to provide either text reports or images that they think may be helpful in the investigation for us. Uh, that website address is NASA MIT Images altogether, N-A-S-A M-I-T Images at JSC for Johnson Space Center at jsc.nasa.gov. Um, so, uh, and we will try to build a uh, billboard or something like that that we can put on NASA TV as well to help folks with that. So again, the phone number is 281-483-3388, and that is for the uh, NASA hotline that has been established. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much, and uh, we will see you guys tomorrow.